Steve Irwin, better known as the Crocodile Hunter, was a wildlife enthusiast and conservationist, owner of the Australia Zoo, and a TV icon loved all over the world. Known for his signature catchphrase, Crikey! His classic khaki uniform and a lot of personality. Steve Irwin became a, you know, a brand. To many, he also seemed like a huge nut, more akin to a reckless uh, circus ringmaster than a dedicated conservationist. But behind all the fun and adventurous image uh, full of manic enthusiasm, you know, khaki shorts, catchphrases, was an intelligent and driven man who was deeply passionate about wildlife conservation and had a sensitive and huge heart for all animals, especially the ones feared most by us. Steve was fascinated by wildlife from a young age. He was gifted a 12-foot python at age six, caught his first crocodile at age nine, and spent his time exploring nature, mostly instead of playing games with his friends. A boy from the suburbs of Melbourne turned his love for wildlife into a multi-billion dollar empire with no degree, no certifications, no expert qualifications. What he did have was an intense passion for wildlife conservation, extraordinary skills with animals thanks to a very atypical upbringing and a charismatic personality. Steve Irwin grew up on a reptile park owned by his parents. He spent his days catching snakes, lizards, and rehabilitating injured animals with his mom and dad. Then over the course of Steve accompanying his father on some government-sponsored expeditions to catch nuisance crocodiles, he had that, aha, this is what I want to do moment. Some of us are lucky enough to have, and almost all of us dream of having, and his life changed forever. Soon he and his father's revolutionary crocodile catching techniques were admired and were being requested all over Australia. Steve enjoyed documenting some of their adventures with an old camera and not having a clue how much that would soon come in real handy. Steve took ownership of his parents' zoo in 1991, met the love of his life just a few days later. Steve and a film crew documented their honeymoon, uh, his honeymoon, not with the whole crew, just with his wife, Terry. And that footage would uh, become the first episode of The Crocodile Hunter, a show that ran for a decade, still is regularly watched today and has reached an audience of millions and millions worldwide. Steve and his family and crew traveled all over the world filming endangered species, many of them dangerous predators, all to promote conservation through exciting education, infotainment. Kind of like what we do here, except I just sometimes talk about dangerous predators. Uh, No one in the right mind wants to keep around, you know, like serial killers. And I never go out into the wild to try and catch them. And now I'm picturing Steve Irwin dressed in his khakis, signature catchphrases in tow, film crew with him as well, going around nabbing some serial killers. Oh, there he is right there in the bushes outside that window. The Melbourne Strangler. Crikey. What a bad boy. What a beauty. Something to remember as we approach him. He's going to be more scared of us than we are of him. Let me refocus. Uh, Steve didn't care about serial killers or true crime. Steve's mission was to get people excited about wildlife, to teach them to love wildlife, even the world's most dangerous wildlife, so that they would then want to protect all of Earth's wildlife. Although he's criticized for his very up-close and personal approach with dangerous animals, that same approach undoubtedly got him the attention he needed to make his show successful and spread his message. And then at the very peak of his success, Steve Irwin tragically died in a freak accident, not involving a crocodile. Instead, it was a stingray. No one saw that coming. He was killed doing something he did almost every day, interacting with wildlife. But instead of being attacked by a crocodile, an apex predator, he was attacked by a creature that is generally considered pretty docile and timid. Even though he never made it to his 45th birthday, Steve left behind a legacy that will last likely for centuries, Living on through his zoo, his documentaries, his animal trapping methods, his influence, uh, refuges uh, refuges named in his honor, species discoveries, and more. He left behind hundreds of square miles of animal sanctuaries, a thriving zoo dedicated to caring for thousands of animals, and a family who honor his legacy by continuing his work preserving wildlife today. Steve always said in interviews, if there's one thing that I, Steve Irwin, would want to be remembered for, it's to be remembered for passion and enthusiasm. Conservation is my job, my life, my whole persona. He has certainly been remembered for passion and enthusiasm. We will cover the life, adventures, tragic death, and the legacy of Steve Irwin, the croc hunter, on today's Crikey, She's a Beauty edition of Time Suck. This is Michael McDonald, and you're listening to Time Suck. (laughs) You're listening to Time Suck. Happy Monday, Meat Sacks. I hope you are having a happy Monday. I hope I am too. Uh, I don't know what's going on with me this Monday. I'll be on vacation. This episode drops, recording a few weeks in advance. Uh, Welcome to the Cult of the Curious. I'm Dan Cummins, a master sucker, karaoke DJ. Probably a better dad than anyone named uh, Gerald Galegos. And you are listening to Time Suck. 
Hail Nimrod, hail Lucifina, praise Bojangles, and glory be to Triple M. I uh, got a fun new piece of merch. So fun in the Bad Magic store this week. New 22-ounce beer mug featuring a traditional uh, traditional looking royal time suck crest. Saying is uh, majestic. Spice up your meals. Dominate your friends with grace. Be the, be the king you've always dreamed of being or queen. Or just check it out at badmagicmerch.com. Uh, while the amount to be donated is still to be determined, this month's charity donation is going to Camp Easton. Boy Scouts camp here in Coeur d'Alene. Uh, camp Easton is where we're hosting our Wet Hot Bad Magic Summer Camp. While visiting this location on many occasions, uh, Lindsay has come to know some of the staff and hear about their needs. As with all places that are host to camps, they have a laundry list of repairs and upgrades that would be incredibly beneficial. It would only seem fitting that we donate to them this month before we go out there and really show them what a good time looks like. Uh, so thank you to everyone who has become a patron of this show and allowed us to uh, to do things like that. And, and that's it. No more drama to discuss this week. Looking ahead now. Uh, the show goes on and thankful, th- very thankful to have it. Uh, not just a fun escape for uh, many of you who listen and enjoy. Definitely a fun one for me too. The most fun. I, I like uh, getting lost in this weird little world very much. So hail Nimrod and uh, hail Lindsay. I mean, Lucifina, but kind of the same. Uh, now let's go re- uh, really get to know the man more synonymous with Crocs than anyone else on earth. Crocodile man. Who doesn't love Crocodile Man? First shown up in 1943, issue 22 of Captain Marvel Adventures, Crocodile Man is a humanoid crocodile from the planet Punkus who acts as an antagonist to Captain Marvel. He was Mr. Mind, second in command, briefly took command of the Monster Society of Evil when Mr. Mind lost his memory, if you recall that. He really stepped up for Mr. Mind. Uh, I mean, until Captain Marvel kicked his, you know, kicked his ass. But I mean, <laughs> it's Captain Marvel, you know. Uh, Crocodile Man was also the uh, second to last minion to leave Mr. Mind. He was, you know, pretty loyal. Going to join a circus sideshow after deciding that crime didn't pay. Uh, wait. Uh, no, no, uh, no one knows who the fuck Crocodile Man is. Uh, so that's not right. He's a very obscure character from the DC Universe whose popularity would have peaked in the 1940s if he would have ever been popular, which he was not. Steve Irwin. That's who we're talking about today. Pretty straightforward narrative structure today, talking about the croc hunter. Steve Irwin, uh, the face of Australian conservation for a long time. I mean, for many, still the face of uh, conservation for Australian or for Australia many years after his death, 16 years after his death. Uh, his memory has truly endured. Before we get into a timeline beginning with his birth and ending with the wildlife reserve established in his honor uh, not long after his death, let's first take a moment to learn a bit about Australia's geography and native species, followed by a brief overview of Australia's conservation efforts before and during Steve's life. Steve Irwin wasn't the only conservationist to make his mark in Australia. There were many before him and many organizations that worked alongside him and his team's efforts. Uh, looking forward to sharing this info. Been, uh, been over a year since we've been to Australia. Not since the great Emu War, episode 232. Uh, not Emu, Emu. I want to get called out on that again. Uh, over a year, time flies. Might have covered some of the following geography yeah, in that episode, but since it's been a while, worth mentioning again. Uh, As I've said before, Australia has no geography because Australia is not fucking real. Come on. How dumb do you have to be to believe in Australia? Back in 2006, the Flat Earth Society, the world's most intelligent collection of truthers, the universe's most prestigious think tank, the greatest collection of brilliant minds ever assembled, acting on a tip from Shelley Floyd, a random Swedish truther who maybe later kind of totally admitted to making all of this up as a joke just to troll everyone for a laugh, exposed an imaginary land enforced by really secret government agents. She said that anyone claiming to be Australian is a crisis actor or a secret government agent or probably both. Australia was made up to cover up the genocide of the 162,000 transported British criminals that never made it to fucking anywhere, period. You don't like hearing that much truth? Well, too bad. Take your hurt feelings, shove them up your leather starfish. And yeah, the Illuminati has been paying pilots to keep this lie going ever since. They have deep pockets, dipshit. Wake the fuck up. (laughs) JK, come on. Uh, But that uh, info is actually how that idiotic conspiracy actually began. No, Australia is very real. I haven't been there, but I have full faith that it's very real. Real geography facts now. Uh, While being the smallest continent, Australia is the sixth largest country in the world. After Russia, Canada, China, the United States, and Brazil. Almost 3 million square miles, almost 4.8 million uh, square kilometers. Uh, I was surprised by Brazil for some reason. I didn't realize it was that big. Not sure what other countries I was expecting in the five spot, but not that one. Almost said Antarctica, <laughs> but did not because I for sure know all the time that that is not a country ever. It's a continent. Uh, Australia is the only country that takes up an entire continent. 
It's ocean territory, the third largest in the world, spanning three oceans, roughly 12 million square kilometers, 7.5 million square miles. And as recently as the early 19th century, Australia was still very wild. Uh, it was comparatively unmodified by large-scale agriculture, like so much of the rest of the world. Its landscape, most of it, was the same as it had been for thousands of years. The Aboriginal people of Australia had lived with the land, not off of it. They practiced land management by burning native vegetation, by never overhunting. Their lifestyle, largely nomadic, had almost no negative impact on the environment. Uh, there also, to be fair, was never that many of them. Modern industry has uh, made conservation more important than ever, but also, even if there was no industry, the sheer number of humans on the planet now, we're quickly closing in on 8 billion, makes conservation efforts more crucial than ever before. We got a lot of mouths to feed. We got a, we got a lot of pollution beating, getting kicked out. Uh, before the British arrived in 1788, there were less than a million aboriginals living across the uh, three square and three million square miles. So that's very, very rural spread out. And with so few people spread across such a vast space and not living in industrial lifestyle, the carbon footprint was minuscule, almost uh, zip, zilch, nothing. The entire continent was pristine. Uh, since Europeans arrived, Australia has lost, at least as described by some sources, most of its biodiversity. Uh, colonizers, colonizers, excuse me, brought non-native invasive species. The population is now 25.7 million people, far more than the, were there when the aboriginals, you know, were the only people living there. Early farmers stripped native vegetation, substituted it for uh, non-native, more profitable, productive crops, pastures. Farmers stocked the central and northern regions of the nation with non-native sheep and cattle, rabbits, camels, horses, deer, pigs, about 25 uh, million feral pigs now, red foxes, cane toads, water buffalo, pet cats that have gone feral, over 2 million of them. These are just some of the non-native animals that have wreaked some havoc on Australia's ecosystem. Even honeybees in Australia are non-native, brought over by Europeans. And perhaps no species has been uh, more destructive than the deadly ombre asino ant, brought over by Spaniards from Peru, originally to torture prisoners with in 1811. Remember those monsters? Uh, the ants, not the Spaniards. Those deadly bastards, still talking about the ants, uh, grew, uh, they grow to about three inches in length, have mandibles strong enough for them to gnaw their way through human bone. Watch a video. It is fucking horrific. Uh, while various forms of sugar is their preferred food source, they can and have eaten humans, especially in Australia. Uh, located along the Goldfields Highway in Western Australia, all that is left of the town of Kathleen now are tombstones. But it was once a small gold mining town, had a general store, a butcher, two hotels, and in 1919, and this never got the appropriate amount of press due to World War I, you know, kind of taking over headlines, an army of ombre asino ants, a plague of biblical proportions, driven into the town by a drought that had left them ravenously hungry, ate every last man, woman, and child in that town. Only about 90 people live there, but still, that's a fucking lot of people to be eaten alive by ants. And what a terrible way to go. Ombre asino ants, uh, incredibly venomous, with enough bites, they will paralyze you. But you will also maintain consciousness. You'll be aware of the thousands of giant, aggressive ants walking around your face, walking into your mouth when you're screaming, going into your ears, chewing into your brain, right? Going through the, the, the soft tissue of your ear canals. I have hated those ants ever since I made them up back in episode 128, Serial Killer Pedro, a monster of the Andes Lopez. I'm hoping that was long enough ago now that I got some more people to fall for that crazy bullshit again. <sighs> Feels good. Uh, now here's something that sounds uh, crazy that is actually true. European rabbits are likely the species that has done the most damage to Australia's wildlife because rabbits really do fuck like rabbits. They can birth more than four litters a year with as many as five kits, AKA baby rabbits in each litter. Since 1859, when they were first introduced into the wild to be hunted, they have bred and bred and bred their way into roughly 200 million Aussie bunnies today. Thomas Austin, a wealthy settler who lived in Victoria, Australia, uh, had just 13 European wild rabbits sent to him from across the world, which he then let roam free on his estate <laughs> from this one backyard sanctuary. It took only around 50 years for these invasive rabbits to spread across the entire continent. All these rabbits need to live is enough soil to burrow in, some short grasses to graze on, and all they need to do to breed is just have a, an intimate 20 seconds with a rabbit of the opposite sex. That's it. Listen, this need less than half a minute. Those horny, fast fucking vermin have eaten enough crops and natural vegetation in places to lead to soil erosion uh, because they'll uh, even eat seedlings. They've killed off several species of trees. They've eaten the food sources out from uh, uh, numerous native species who have uh, gone extinct because of it, like the lesser bilby, super cute rabbit-like marsupial, marsupial uh, gone since around 1960. And uh, so sad 
due to the immense loss of habitat thanks to all these fucking rabbits, just last month, uh, koalas, aka koala bears, went extinct. So uh, good job, you horny hopping dipshits. Can't believe all those cute little koalas are fucking gone now, so that's too sad. Let's move along from that. Uh, despite losing countless species the past two centuries, Australia is still home to an estimated 200 to 300,000 species of animals. The continent is still home to possums, uh, to quokkas, which are super cute little cat-sized wallabies, little 10-pound-ish marsupials, pretty docile. Uh, very interesting. They also do one super messed up thing. Occasionally as a defense mechanism, and I swear this is not my stupid bullshit this time, if a female quokka with a joey in her pouch is cornered, and, and, and scared, you know, some predator, she will eject her baby, like literally launch it the fuck out of her pouch. Her pouch will make a little crazy, like a little hissing sound. When this happens, she'll escape during this distraction while the predator is busy being distracted by eating her fucking baby. <laughs> she'll run off and, uh, and live on. Ugh. I mean, evolutionary wise, I do get it. The same species gestates in less, uh, in just a month and can often uh, uh, get pregnant immediately after conception. And they have this other odd adaptation that allows them to essentially have a backup fetus just on deck, just waiting on deck. And in case something happens to the Joey in the pouch, uh, like if, like it gets ejected, this backup fetus just starts, you know, turning into another Joey. And if, and if the fetus or the, the little Joey in the pouch doesn't get ejected and makes it out of the pouch successfully, uh, then this fetus just gets reabsorbed into the body and gets pregnant again. So they're not terribly worried about any particular little baby making it to adulthood. Wild shit. Also fucking cold blooded. So crazy to think about humans if we had adapted that way. <laughs> like imagine <laughs> what life would look like if our first instinct as parents was to sacrifice our young <laughs> for the first couple years of their lives. Like some mom just starts getting carjacked. Just, no, 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 please. Just take my baby. Please just take, leave, leave me. Leave, just take my baby. Like if that was totally socially, like if that was not only acceptable, but expected to do. Some family being chased by a grizzly bear out in the Alaskan wilderness Maybe chased by a tiger in some jungle in India. One of the parents just fucking hucks their two-year-old back down the trail by themselves some time. Sorry, Baba! Your sacrifice will not be in vain! We'll name our next baby after you, son! Uh, Australia, uh, also uh, still home to kookaburras, a bird that makes the most insane sound I think I've ever heard a bird make. I would absolutely for sure try and kill these motherfuckers if they hung outside my window and were making this noise at, you know, like 6 a.m. or really at any time. This is a video of three of these bastards perched on a, on a rail, railing on a balcony, either a condo or a, like a hotel room in Sydney. This is oppressive. So loud. Oh my God. And, and they're like four feet away and these birds aren't even leaving. I would, oh my God, I would absolutely want to get a pellet gun and just start sniping them. I would not want to hear that mirth and merriment. It's so fucking funny, you obnoxious motherfuckers. And I say, uh, because uh, instead of chirping, it's referred to as laughing. It's a horrible laugh. Australia is uh, still home to kangaroos, uh, koalas. Wait, did I say koalas uh, were all dead earlier? I apologize. That wasn't true. That was, they're fine. That was, fuck, that was gross. That was gross of me to do that. How many of you did a quick web search to, when you got sad to find out if I was bullshit or not? In truth, koalas are pretty much fine. They're kind of fine. There's 40 to 50,000 left in the wild. So that's not bad. Uh, Australia also has wallabies, uh, wombats, dingoes, platypuses, echidnas, described pretty accurately in one video I watched as a walking ball of spines. They're a little spiny anteater. Australia is definitely home to like, I'd say the majority of the, of the planet's like weirdest looking species. They're also in Australia's rainforest, uh, giant cassowaries. These birds look like dinosaurs, craziest looking birds I've definitely ever seen. They can grow to a height of two meters, over six feet tall, like around six and a half feet tall. They can weigh up to 130 pounds. They have these big ass dinosaur looking feet. They can't fly, but they can swim and they can run their asses off. They can run to just over 30 miles an hour. That is fucking moving. And they can swim 250 miles an hour. No, that'd be insane. <laughs> I wish they could do that. I wish I saw a bird just fucking hauling ass across the water like a sports car. No, but they can kick with razor sharp claws. They can jump up to seven feet in the air. That's terrifying. Uh, they've been called the world's most dangerous bird. They have legitimately killed some humans before. They've slashed like arteries and stuff. Only around 2,000 of these giant monster birds left. And those 2,000 are hard to find because they're super shy. 
Uh, BBC Earth got some great footage of these things. If you can find that video on YouTube. Uh, feral invasive pigs are a very big threat to these dinosaur birds. They eat the fruit that the cassowaries need to survive. They eat their eggs. Fucking pigs. Uh, Australia has so many unusual animals. They have Tasmanian devils, emus, countless lizards, snakes, so many creepy, gigantic spiders. And of course, crocodiles and more. And many of their most unique species are endangered or near extinction. Uh, long before the Irwins showed up on the conservation scene, many others in Australia began to grow concerned about not losing some of Australia's odd and interesting animals and also very unique vegetation. Public pressure for conservation began in the early 20th century, uh, increased in the late 20th century. The Wildlife Preservation Society of Australia has been active since the, the beginning of the 20th century. It formed on May 19th, 1909 in Sydney. This, uh, this group successful in obtaining protection for the koala in 1911 and uh, 1912 in New South Wales, soon took action against the growth of the plume trade, the buying and selling of feathers. Oh, they should have fucking sold those kaka, kookaburra's feathers. They should have let them sell all those fucking feathers. Uh, but yeah, the, uh, the trafficking of wild birds. They took federal action to prohibit the import and export of plumes and even convinced the governor general's wife to make a statement against using real bird feathers in women's hats. That same society has spent the past century working with governments, uh, or the government, excuse me, to pass laws and bills protecting plants and animals across Australia. An early renowned individual Australian environmentalist who's done a great deal for conservation efforts in the country is Dr. John Wamsley, born in New South Wales in 1938, still living today, just co-authored a memoir published two years ago, A Vanishing Kind. And decades ago, he spearheaded a movement to set up a network of wildlife sanctuaries across the country continent. In June of 1969, he purchased a dairy farm in Mylor, South Australia, and he would transform that farm into the innovative uh, Warawong Sanctuary. Per the uh, still operating sanctuary, sanctuary's website, Warawong Wildlife Sanctuary is the only place on mainland South Australia where you may see the elusive platypus. The sanctuary is also a thriving ecosystem where hundreds of Australian native animals flourish. Koalas, kangaroos, wallabies, bandicoots, uh, potaroos, uh, betongs, and birds rarely seen outside the feral-proof fence all live safe and protected at Warawong. The award-winning sanctuary was founded again, yeah, 1969, uh, John Wamsley, this is from the website, when he purchased a 35-acre dairy. Later, he and his wife, Prue, surrounded the property with a 2.1-meter-high, electrified, feral-proof fence. The fence created the safe haven where native animals were protected from introduced predators like cats and foxes. Many consider this approach to be a world's first. Uh, those betongs, uh, they look like a rabbit-sized kangaroo. Holy shit, can those things jump? It's like their legs are made out of powerful springs. It's so crazy to watch videos of them. Uh, highly recommend those videos. Three out of five stars. Wouldn't change a thing. A uh, chapter of the World Wildlife Fund has also helped uh, a lot with conservation efforts in, in Australia. Uh, the World Wildlife Fund was founded on April 29th, 1961 in Morgus, Switzerland. The WWF partnered with scientists, businesses, government leaders with the support of Prince Bernhard of the Netherlands and the Duke of Edinburgh. They called for global action to end the hunting and habitat destruction of threatened and endangered species. Not against all hunting. That's a common misconception. Uh, as much as some especially sensitive people hate to hear it, which I get, I love animals too, responsible hunting is great for wildlife. If there's too many deer in an area, for example, thinning out the members of the, of the deer to the, the numbers through hunting prevents more of those animals from dying off later via disease or starvation. You know, if, and if you're a deer, uh, would you rather be taken out via a bullet to the head or heart? Or would you want a, a pack of wolves to take you down by doing what they do? I'm going to pick a bullet every time. Sorry, the hunter in me felt the need to defend uh, it a bit. Is it uh, something that is actually ethical? Uh, anyway, WWF Australia was established in 1978, initially with just three staff working out of an old Sydney factory. Now their website lists 16 different key employees with teams of additional employees working under some of them and loads of volunteers. WWF is considered the largest, most influential independent conservation organization in the world. It remains one of Australia's largest conservation organizations. And then there's Martin Copley, a little over a decade later, the same year Irwin took over his parents' Queensland Reptile and Fauna Park, the Australian Wildlife Con uh, Conservancy was founded. Martin Copley kicked it off August 2nd, 1991. Martin established AWC's first sanctuary, uh, Karakomia, in the Perth Hills. He wanted to end Australia's extinction crisis and reverse the decline of native wildlife. He was inspired by the work of environmentalist John Wamsley, who started that Werewong Sanctuary, right? Uh, his work allowed native you know, mammals to flourish. Karakomia was the first private nature reserve in Western Australia. Karakomia officially opened December 22nd, 1994, backed by the Western Australian Department of Conservation and Land Management. 
They release mammals like brush-tailed betongs, uh, quendas, type of bandicoot, into a predator-free fenced area. In 1998, uh, Martin also established the uh, Peruna Wildlife Sanctuary, just under 6,200 acres of land dedicated to conservation. In 1999, the AWC established an island arc at Fower Island in partnership with the Western Australian government. Not sure about the pronunciation of Fower Island. Couldn't find a video of anyone saying it. Uh, they undertook a feral herbivore eradication program. We're able to eradicate the introduced species on, on the island, protecting and increasing native plant and animal populations. AWC is a growing organization that continues to purchase sanctuaries, reintroduce endangered species, and increase wildlife populations all across Australia. And they now own, work in, uh, work in partnership with, or manage 31 separate wildlife sanctuaries, over 16 million acres, helping protect a continent nation with some of the most di- biodiversity, again, of any nation on earth. And along with all these private organizations and others, you know, the Australian government has established many reserves in all the states and territories to protect plants and animals. In 2010, the government implemented Australia's biodiversity conservation strategy, scheduled to continue until at least 2030. They plan to collaborate with federal, state, territory, uh, local governments to achieve conservation over two decades and then reassess and continue with additional efforts. And uh, there are currently around 3,000 endemic vertebrate animals and 18,000 endemic plant species in Australia. Over 20,000 different types of fauna and flora native to the continent. At least 60 species of plants and animals have gone extinct since tracking and identifying them back in the late 19th and early 20th centuries began. All these organizations' conservation efforts led by people who share some of the late Steve Irwin's passion are doing their best to keep all these different species uh, uh, left around uh, you know, for the future. Okay. All right. With all that context established, uh, let's now dive into the timeline of, uh, you know, of uh, Australia's primary conservation hero, Steve Irwin. We'll discuss his life from birth through death with a few descriptions of his adventures in Australia. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a time suck timeline. Stephen Robert Irwin. Born February 22nd, 1962 in Upper Fern Tree Gully, Melbourne, part of the state of Victoria, Australia. Upper Fern Tree Gully, a suburb of Melbourne, per the 2016 census, it has a population of just 3,416 people. It was a farming area in its early days, formed the end of the electric train line for Melbourne. Many, many Melburians enjoy uh, holidaying in the cottages of Upper Fern Tree Gully, at least uh, they did in the 1930s especially. In more recent years, it's become a pretty typical suburb. They have a minor league baseball team, the Tigers. A few players who've ended up in the major league baseball system here in the States and Canada have played for them. Steve's parents, Robert and Lynn Irwin. Robert Irwin, let's pretend he was known as Bobbert, even though he was definitely known as Bob, was a plumber who studied herpetology uh, on the side. And herpetology is the studies, uh, the study of herpes. And he specialized in eyeball and pee hole herpes. Or herpetology is a branch of zoology concerned with the study of amphibians and reptiles. Okay, probably that. Uh, Lynn was a maternity nurse who loved wildlife rehabilitation. Uh, Bobbert Irwin, born June 8th, 1939 in Melbourne, raised by his mother, Marjorie, during the Great Depression, grew up extremely poor, but was taught a a fantastic work ethic and would later work his ass off to provide for his family. He is uh, currently 83. He's been married to his second wife, Judy Irwin, since 2004. Uh, You know, he got married four years after his first wife's death. Bobbert, still in good health, on October 25th, 2016, released a memoir, The Last Crocodile Hunter, A Father and Son Legacy. Uh, Not sure his son Steve would approve of this memoir or not. Based on some of Steve's uh, stories in his biography, it doesn't seem like Bob was always the nicest, most patient man, but but Steve did definitely love him. Uh, The rest of the family seems like they've had mixed feelings about Bob in recent years. Uh, June of 2021, his granddaughter, Bindi, Steve's daughter, claimed that her entire life has been psychological abuse from him and that Bob never said a single kind word to her. Steve seemed to inherit his dad's love of reptiles, but not his temperament. Uh, Lynn Irwin, born Lynn uh, Hakinson. No, I fucking idea how to say her last name. I've never seen this word before. (laughs) Hakinson. Seems Dutch to me or something. Uh, She was born February uh, 22nd, 1941 to parents Vesta and Frank. Uh, Lynn died on February 11th, 2000 in a car accident. Bobbert and Lynn were friends as children then fell in love as teenagers after their hormones kicked in and their genitals started to work a little differently because that's how it works, I think. They got married when Bobbert was 20, Lynn was 18 in 1959 and probably started having sex a bit before that. Hard to say. Steve never talked about his parents' sex life for some weird reason. Anyway, that was unnecessary. Back to Bobbert and Lynn. After getting married, they started a family right away. Of course he did. 
right? They, they've been fucking before. Come on, we all know it. Bob and Lynn would have three children, Joy, Steve, and Mandy. The birth dates of Steve's siblings not listed, but Joy's a year or two older, Mandy a few years younger. Just kind of uh, peeking around in some other articles and making an educated guess. Uh, growing up, Steve's house was uh, full of reptiles, orphan kangaroos, other animals. Bob had a serious reptile obsession, a collecting habit. And Lynn loved caring for and rehabilitating injured and orphaned mammals. In 1968, when Steve was six, his dad gave him a 12-foot scrub python for his birthday. He named it Fred. Although he couldn't really play with Fred, he loved the responsibility of caring for an animal and studying its behavior. He couldn't play with Fred because, you know, Fred was a fucking large and dangerous predator and he was a tiny kid. Australian scrub pythons, largest, longest snake in Australia, non-venomous, but they will constrict and choke the fuck out of some prey. They can also bite you with some pretty decent fangs. They can weigh over 60 pounds, reach over 18 feet in length. That's a lot of snake. And sometimes they do kill people, mostly kids. Uh, back in 2019, a dad saved his four-year-old son from a 16-foot scrub python by punching it in the fucking head after it grabbed his boy, started dragging him into the bush, fucker bit his son in the leg, started pulling him away. But Steve, he was fine. He wasn't, <laughs> he wasn't four. His dad wasn't irresponsible. Gosh dang, he was six. If a six-year-old can't handle a 12-foot python, then well, I think we can all agree that he deserves to be eaten. Come on, you little ankle biter. Handle your snake. I'll get fucked, you little cunt. By the way, it's totally okay for me to casually toss about cunt as much as I want to in this episode. It's not offensive if you're uh, Australian or if you say it with a shitty Australian accent. From what I understand, cunt. Totally fine. Might as well be saying, hello. Good day. Good day, cunt. Uh, 1969, at the age of seven, Steve caught a common brown, aka Eastern brown, highly venomous snake. These uh, little thin snakes can grow to be about seven feet long. Second most venomous snake in the world. Australia also has the most venomous snake in the world, the Inland Taipan snake. Cool. So many fun snakes. The type of snake that Steve nabbed is uh, responsible for more deaths from snake bite in Australia than any other species. Between 2005 and 2015, they killed 15 people that we know of. So not really that dangerous. And it's not like Steve was some little dipshit kid anymore when he caught his uh, you know, snake. He's, he's seven. He's seven. He's ready for snakes like this. This in animal interaction, a uh, little spark inside Steve, and he would write about it later. He realized he loved animals, dangerous animals, and wanted to work with them when he grew up. Steve would describe this experience in detail in his 2001 biography. Uh, he said that he and his father were in the bush in northern Victoria looking for snakes, just doing normal dad and young son shit. Some dads play catch with you, take you fishing. Other dads take you out into the bush, turn you loose around dangerous snakes. Young Sne Steve pretended he was uh, in the army on a mission to capture his father. I love it. I was constantly living in imagination land like that when I was a kid. Uh, Steve took aim with his pretend gun, but then got distracted when he noticed a seven foot brown snake by his foot. Excuse me. Uh, when the snake slithered away, he pinned it with his foot, called out to his dad that he'd found a snake. Bob ran up, thumped him in the shoulder hard enough to send him crash into a boulder. And then he fell to the ground and skinned his knees. Bob called him a bloody idiot. Scolded him for fucking with the dangerous snake, even though he had taken him out into the bush specifically to look for snakes. And clearly was not keeping a real close eye on him. Uh, little Steve was heartbroken and confused, right? He was so proud of himself for catching the snake, but then his dad was angry. Why? Steve decided he was going to run away. When Steve stopped crying, apparently his dad went back to looking for more snakes. Steve found a cave and decided to live in it forever. <laughs> Which sounds like a little kid decision. Bob spent the next hour looking for Steve. Meanwhile, Steve played with some skinks, some little lizards inside that cave. And when Bob found his son, he was fucking pissed. Well, you know what, Bob? Maybe you shouldn't have bounced him off a rock. If he didn't want him to scamper away. Uh, after his initial anger faded, he explained to his son that brown snakes are the second most venomous snake in the world and that they're aggressive when threatened. He said that he pushed Steve into a boulder because the snake was about to bite his ankle. And that experience taught Steve the importance of wildlife education and safety. Also, probably should have taught his dad to communicate a little bit better. <laughs> Maybe he should have told Steve what kind of dangerous snakes to look out for before turning him loose into the bush to look for snakes as, as a seven-year-old kid. Just a thought. Just, you know, just uh, tossing out there. 1970, when Steve was eight, his parents made a decision that would change his life forever. They decided to force him to fend for himself in the bush for a year. Figure it out already. Learn which snakes, learn which snakes are good. Learn which ones are bad. Figure out how to dominate crocs and other predators or just do the world a favor and fucking die already. We have enough weaklings. Stop fucking about. You're right for God's sake. Almost a man. No, of course not. No, they purchased two acres of property in uh, Bewalk, Queensland to fund Bob's growing interest in collecting reptiles. <laughs> and before we go further, oh shit, do I have a good video for you? Uh, I, I typed Biwa, Queensland, 
uh, into the YouTube search bar. Look, just looking for a video to learn how to pronounce this uh, town. And I, and I came across a hidden gem. Only 24 views on this video when I found it. And it's been out a little while, but now it's September 16th, 2021. Posted by channel Annihilator. Some guy looks, <laughs> looks like he's around 50 years old. Not happy about living there, speaking straight into his camera. You know, it sounds like he's lived in Biwa for uh, quite a while and he fucking hates it. Uh, the title of this video is Biwa Queensland is Hell on Earth. And I kept waiting for him to say, just kidding. Nope. So this is just uh, it's a little under three minutes long and I think it's worth a ride. What is it like to live in Biwa Queensland? Man. <sighs> hell. It's hell on earth. The businesses here suck. I mean, there's one shop here. This will give you an idea of how fucking demented the people are that live in this region. They shut down for lunchtime a fish and chip shop so she can go have her lunch. Have you ever heard of anything so crazy? And I haven't heard of anything that crazy it is in weird. all my fucking days. It is weird. I'll give you that. No businesses here really open, except for big ones like Woolies and that are open here for, for business hours. They don't follow the rules. Like you go in there and you buy something, they go, oh, by the way, if it's the wrong one or it's broken or whatever, don't bring it back. If you buy it, it's yours. So, yeah, just, just make up the fucking retail laws as we go along, shall we? <laughs> Do you get threatened to be beaten up on the street if you go for a walk? It is just a living hell. I put out my bin the other night at 8 o'clock at night. My new neighbour who's lived here for a week who was determined to make a great impression, I had no shirt on, was yelling at me about uh, being obese and a creep and a low life and all this. <laughs> and I just said to him, nice first impression. Great. You've lived here a week and that's how you want to introduce yourself? It's 8 o'clock at night in the dark. I'm taking my bin out. You're on your front lawn with your idiot family yelling that crap? I mean, are you for real, dude, or what? And then I just went inside because I just, just knew it would escalate to a biff and I'd get in trouble for knocking his teeth out or whatever, even though I took the bin out and got abused by some lunatic. So, you know, that's Beale, Queensland. You go for a bike ride, you have three different people pull over out of their car and run over and threaten to belch up on the footpath. They're on the road, but they just don't like you riding anywhere. You know, so it's Thugville, Scumville, Uneducatedville, uh, the businesses here, you won't get fresh food. If you, you, you could beg and plead for fresh food. They will serve you a stale sandwich and it'll just be cooked exactly how you didn't ask for it and everything else. So Beer of Queensland's my idea of hell. I pray for death all day long. Please, God, <laughs> it's time for me to fucking be upstairs with you. Um, and with COVID, I can't go anywhere. But this place is a shithole. I don't care what it does to the real estate value to my house either, they're pointing it out. It's a shithole. That's how much I hate it here. I'm willing to lose money to fucking point it out. Fuck off, Biwa people. You're a bunch of scum. So, <laughs> so that's Biwa. Just fucking nothing but scum. Just fucking, ev just nothing but scum. Uh, my favorite part was uh, you get threatened to get beaten up on the street if you just go for a walk. Like he said it like that literally happens every time you try to go for a walk. Like you just leave your house. Maybe you've walked, I don't know, 20, 20 steps. Oi, what's this? You think you're going for a fucking walk? Nah, mate. I punch your fucking teeth out. No one walks around Biwa. <laughs> this fucking, this fucking piece of shit. They think you fucking walk around Biwa. I'll fucking, you got to pay your fucking five finger toll, mate. Love it. So, you know, so Steve grew up in hell on earth. A uh, real shithole. Uh, today, be wild, <laughs> almost 8,000 8, scumbags is less than a half hour drive from the Sunshine Coast. Smattering of different cities that combined houses around 350,000 people. Uh, Biwa, mostly known for what Steve's parents uh, would build there, the Australia Zoo, and for being where Steve grew up. One of the main roads in town is uh, that you can't walk on without getting beat up. It's called Steve Irwin Way. Uh, also known for a giant wooden lawnmower art installation. Not even kidding. Uh, there's this weird and very silly and fun collection of sculptures and large, you know, just structures. Uh, most of them novelty structures created by different artists going back to 1915, but, but mainly starting to catch on in the 1960s, collectively called Australia's Big Things. There's an estimated 230 plus of these tourist traps, like the Big Banana, 43 feet long, 16 feet tall, sexy as fuck. Uh, it's in Coffs Harbor in New South, New South Wales. There's a, a Big Bull, 
46 feet high, 69 feet long, uh, 25 foot tall sundial, 33 foot long trout, 45 foot long tennis racket. <laughs> and in addition to so many other big things, a 36 foot tall lawnmower in Biwa. Uh, Steve attended Lansborough State School and later uh, Caloundra State High School. Steve never spoke a ton about his schooling. I don't think he really cared that much about uh, formal school. Uh, he learned the basics, but sitting at a desk inside, definitely never his style. He wanted to be outdoors in nature, chasing down, watching uh, strange critters. Young Steve often arrived late to school because he constantly convinced his mom to stop on the way to rescue lizards and th- little critters from the road, like father, like son. Steve also uh, later said he was bullied in primary school, aka grade school or elementary school, because he wasn't into motorbikes and skateboards. Like the other kids, probably, you know, well, of course, probably got a lot of bullies in Biwa. Fuck your lizards, Steven. Can you kick, flip, or what, you silly little cunt? Uh, during lunch and whatever other free time he had at school, he was, uh, you know, reading about, looking at uh, birds, lizards, other animals. Most other kids uh, at school thought he was a fucking weirdo. He was kind of a weirdo. But over time, he was able to convince some of them to get in on his animal obsession. His parents, Bobbert and Lynn, became part of Australia's conservation efforts by housing rare species on their new property there. They decided to open up their property to visitors as the Biwa Reptile and Fauna Park initially. Hoped it would be the start of a full-fledged zoo, which is exactly what it has become. Uh, Bob participated in most of the construction of his Biwa Reptile Park. During their first years working on it, the family lived in an RV caravan. Bob constructed a shed, later built his family a house on the property. Steve participated in the construction of these buildings as much as he could. He later wrote, uh, Dad knew he needed to be enthusiastic about my helping him. As it's during these younger years that a young fellow develops work ethics and skills. I worked hard and was rewarded with field trips. The family would live in the house they built until Bob retired and gave the park to Steve. Although Wikipedia says the park opened June 3rd, 1970, according to Steve and Terry Irwin's book, The Crocodile Hunter, The Incredible Life and Adventures of Steve and Terry Irwin, the Biwa Reptile Park opened for business in 1973. At first, the reptile park was just a small roadside zoo with snakes, some crocs, few kangaroos. But Bob and Lynn and the kids worked hard for years and grew the zoo into something great. Steve accompanied his dad on many expeditions to catch lizards, venomous snakes, crocs, for the growing zoo. Bob Irwin was now developing a reputation not just around Australia, but around the world in certain select circles for his legendary snake catching skills and croc uh, catching skills. He would catch his snakes with nothing but bare hands and quick reflexes. He captured taipans, browns, I mean, the most venomous snakes in the world. You know, death adders all over Australia. Steve spent his childhood years carefully observing his father, which contributed to his up and close animal wrangling style later in life. Uh, the, the croc obsession makes so much more sense to me now. He came by his crazy ass, let's uh, get up in that croc's face uh, techniques honestly, right? Earnestly. He learned it from his dad. He grew up in the family business, surrounded by dangerous reptiles, other animals for literally as long as he could remember. Steve spent much of the 70s from the age of eight to 18 wrestling crocs, studying snakes, catching snakes, assisting Queensland University researchers with uh, bird surveys. The university liked to work with Steve because he was good at climbing trees. Of course he was. I mean, this dude was basically uh, an Australian Tarzan. Also grew up helping his, uh, his mum nurse and rehabilitate abandoned kangaroos, uh, wallabies, birds that came to the park. The uh, Biwa Reptile Park was home to animals like lace monitors, tiger snakes, fresh wild crocs, fresh wild, fresh, you know, you've heard of fresh wild crocs, uh, fresh water crocodiles, magpie geese, kangaroos. Steve's mother specialized in wildlife rehabilitation and skilled in nursing injured and orphaned animals. Together, Bob and Lynn were becoming known all over the country for their wildlife rehab efforts. Steve always called his mom the Mother Teresa of wildlife rehabilitation. Uh, Liz was revolutionary in her own way. She pioneered many of the techniques still used today to care for baby kangaroos. She made artificial pouches, special food formulas, uh, developed nursing techniques. Uh, she would nurse uh, them, them, you know, herself. She would use her own teats, and uh, and that's still how it's done. You know, if you want to get into kangaroo rehabilitation. You got to get those titties out and you got to put them to work if you care about, if you care about wildlife. No, she never did that, but she, uh, she, she, she does some other techniques. Not that uh, she cared for injured sugar gliders. Uh, those are cute little things, strange little possums, kind of like flying squirrels. You know, while scientists were still trying to figure out exactly what the fuck they were. Uh, Lynn always stopped when she found a dead kangaroo on the road because more often than not, the females had babies still living in their pouches and those little joeys, you know, she had heard and then found out for herself that they are fucking delicious. I mean, you're not normally supposed to eat baby kangaroos. I get that. But if the mom dies and it's been too long since they've last eaten, you know, to be able to save them and they're just still barely alive, well, count your blessings. If you can rush home and boil them, 
Drop everything and do that. Mm -mm, hot damn. Uh, don't kill them first. You don't gut them. You don't skin them. You just toss them into that boiling water and start drooling. Let that stomach grumble. When they're mostly cooked, about 15 minutes later, you take out a hammer and you smash the fuck out of them on the counter. Then you put the mess you've made in a crock pot. Carrots, potatoes, beef broth. Set it, forget it. About 12 hours, season to taste. And then, lucky you. You get to eat that sweet fucking joey. Mmm, fur, baby bones. Yum, yum, bon appetit. Uh, JK, of course. <laughs> I'll try not to make you simultaneously sad and nauseous for the rest of the episode. Uh, what Lynn would really do is to take these little orphan joeys back home and nurse them back to health. Not with the real tits, fake ones. I don't think she would approve of this episode. While Bob taught Steve how to observe and catch wildlife, Lynn taught Steve compassion and love for animals. During his childhood, instead of traditional pets, Steve had, uh, you know, various wild animals, like uh, some birds. He'd play with Curly, a curlew, cute little bird. Uh, there was Brawly, a Brolga, a uh, type of crane. And then there was uh, Egghead, an emu. Steve liked to play uh, army with his birds. He wrote in his uh, biography later that Egghead liked to eat his marbles and his dad's nails. Okay, probably should have kept a closer eye on Egghead's diet. Fucking emus. I still think about those strange, tough, weird birds from the Great Emu War episode. Uh, Steve didn't just fuck around playing with the animals all the time. He also spent part of his childhood doing some normal kids shit like sports. He would dabble in swimming, football, cricket, soccer, surfing. He and his dad played badminton together as well. At the zoo, of course. Uh, but these sports always took a backseat to animals. One day during a cricket match as a kid, he abandoned the game in favor of capturing seven red bellies blacks. Oh, look at it. What a beauty. It's another highly venomous snake. Always dangerous snakes with the Irwin boys. Uh, he put the snakes he caught in the bus driver's cooler. Then he and his friends begged the bus driver to let Steve take the snakes home. When the bus driver dropped Steve off, he informed his dad that Steve was banned from the bus going forward. Steve wrote that when Bob found out he had put snakes in this guy's cooler, he, quote, sunk his boot right up my bum so hard I dropped the cooler. <laughs> oh, Bobbert. Ah, sometimes I go back and forth on how I feel about Bobbert. Guided his son into a great conservationist career, but sometimes it kind of seems like a prick. Uh, so when did the future croc hunter star get his uh, first introduced specifically to crocodiles, to those living dinosaurs? 1971, at age nine, Steve caught his first croc. Right? Sounds about right. Par for the course. Get the boy giant python, age six. Taking him out looking for snakes in an area littered with the most venomous snakes in the world at age seven. Now that he's the ripe old age of nine, let's fucking turn him loose in some crocs. During the 70s, young Steve, very young at the beginning of the decade, worked with Papa Irwin to capture problem crocodiles by wrestling them into a small dinghy. Big apprentice, needless endangerment, Papa Irwin. Uh, Bob taught Steve the crocodile jumping and restraint techniques that will make him famous later in life. Steve wrote about catching that first croc in a 2001 book. Bobber had been asked by Queensland National Parks and Wildlife Service to catch and relocate a small colony of freshwater crocs in North Queensland. Freshies, freshies, ah, ripper. Uh, as they're sometimes called, usually relatively small and harmless if left alone. They can still have a nasty bite. And by relatively small, I do want to point out that a full-grown adult male will average around 150 pounds and seven feet in length. Females about 90 pounds and five to six feet in length. So still fucking crocs. Uh, the method of capture Bob used was uh, simple. Uh, go out on the water at night, spotlight these crocs, and then literally jump on them. I'm surprised Bob and his son Steve uh, were physically capable of doing this, or even walking, actually. I mean, how do they move around normally at all with their sets of giant fucking balls that it would have taken to uh, wrestle crocs in the wild like that? At night, no less. No, thank you. Me and my tiny balls are just going to read and talk about it. Uh, Steve's job while dad was croc jumping was to idle the boat as quietly as possible in the direction of his dad's spotlight and the croc's eye shine, which is how they'd spot him at night. They'd creep those peepers. When they got close, Bob would lurk up to the front of the boat. He'd put his spotlight down while Steve raised up his to show that eye shine. Then as soon as they got right next to that croc, Bob jumped on it, grabbing it around the neck, wrapping his arms and legs around it. The water must not have been that deep when they were doing this. this is insane. Once Bob tired the croc out, he'd throw it into the boat where little Steve, nine years old, would then jump on and restrain it inside the boat while dad climbed aboard. What the fuck? Bob, once on board, put a blindfold on the crocodile and then he transferred into a bag. Well, on this particular night, Bob was putting a croc into a bag while Steve scanned the water hole for more eye shines. Bob switched their usual positions. He idled the boat closer and closer to a croc they saw. Bob then told little Steve, get up there, boy. That will close closer until Bob shouted, now! Nah! Without thinking, Steve jumped onto the water, jumped onto this crocodile, slammed his chin down onto the head, rolled over and over. Bob pulled him and the croc up into the boat. Uh, Steve wrote, he was shaking his head in disbelief with a grin from ear to ear. I could feel his pride in me. 
although the capture had certainly made him a little nervous. I would hope so. Did, didn't make him too nervous, though. Not nervous enough to think, like, wait a minute. Maybe telling my nine-year-old to jump into the water on a top of a crock. Maybe not the best idea. Uh, clearly, it worked out all right. But also, clearly, Steve seemed to nearly dodge a lot of unnecessary bullets in his childhood. I mean, try explaining something like that to, uh, to a Child Protective Services caseworker. H- how is that child endangerment? It's not like I told my third grader to jump on a big crock. We're not talking about saltwater crocks. I'm not a psychopath. I'm going to wait until he's ready for that. Going to wait until he's at least in fourth grade or some shit. I know how to parent. However, uh, shit like this is what made the croc hunter the croc hunter, right? This is how Steve developed his passion for crocs. Had his dad not been a little bit of a psycho, uh, you know, he wouldn't have built the legacy he did. Does that make it right though? I kept questioning that during this research. Maybe, maybe not. I mean, I mean, Joe Jackson raised very successful musicians. <laughs> had he not pushed them from an early age, no one would have heard of the Jackson Five. Also legendarily terrible father who beat the shit out of his kids all the time. Uh, love who the croc hunter became. Not 100% sold on how dad helped him get there in moments. Uh, going forward throughout his childhood and obviously throughout his adulthood, Steve loved studying croc's behavior. He was that, uh, you know, uh, he, he understood that relocation was critically important because it protected crocodiles from locals who wanted to shoot them. He'd be able to relocate crocs like almost no one could thanks to spending time with his dad, developing skills that a lot of other animal handlers would never develop. Better croc catching, probable child abuse, Papa Bob. Uh, 1979, Steve turns 17 and loses his virginity to a crocodile. His dad pushed him too far with the animals. Didn't encourage him to spend enough time with other humans. Steve would later write, Crikey, she was a beauty. Freshwater Australian croc, six feet long, 80 pounds, nice and curvy. Ripper. I'd wrestled crocs before, but never like that. She'd laid eggs about uh, four weeks later. And when they hatched three months after that, I was right nervous. They'd have her body in my face. Crikey, I was worried dad was going to slink his boots so far up my bum, I'd be tasting his laces. Ripper! No. 17, Steve got his driver's license. Saved up for a year, and then at the age of 18, purchased his first car. An old yellow uh, Toyota Hilux that had more rust than metal, he said. Uh, looking up how to pronounce the name of that truck, uh, sent me quite the internet wormhole. Uh, props to Cody Detweiler. This guy hosts the Whistling Diesel YouTube channel. That guy is fucking funny. And he does these durability tests on these Toyota Hilux and just other you know, vehicles and beats the ever-loving shit out of them. It is ridiculous what he does. Uh, and this, this Toyota Hilux is almost indestructible. They're like, as one YouTube commenter uh, pointed out, a uh, GTA, Grand Theft Auto vehicle in real life. Yeah. So I can see why Steve got one, right? Perfect truck for riding out into the bush, looking for snakes and crocs and shit. After nabbing his truck and graduating secondary school, a.k.a. high school, Steve planned a seven-week trip with Papa Bob to the Cape York Peninsula, way up in far north Queensland, only about 40 miles across the ocean from Papua New Guinea, to study the first specimens of an undescribed species of goanna, these big lizards. He was going to uh, live in his truck the entire time. He said, uh, totally entrenched in the jungle. Bob decided they should catch a pair for uh, breeding and behavior studies. And it would take them until 1993 to complete this project, 13 years. Steve would finally catch a few specimens of an unidentified species of goanna, bring it back to a special breeding enclosure, bring them back. At a zoo, uh, the work allowed scientists to study the goannas and write some research papers. 1980, Bob and Lynn rebrand the park, now naming it Queensland Reptile and Fauna Park. Hoping that a name change will bring more visitors, make it sound bigger, less local, and it was getting bigger. One of their park visitors who would visit in 1986 was about to turn a 14-year-old, uh, he, uh, was Wes Mannion. He's about to turn 14 when he did this. I phrased that weird. Wes was fascinated by the park and wanted to be a part of a special place that cared for animals deeply. He idolized Steve, who was 24, wanted to work with him. Uh, Bob and Lynn hired him to maintain the grounds care for animals. Steve uh, became his mentor and eventually one of his best friends. And Wes still works at the park today. In the TV series, The Crocodile Hunter, he was Steve Irwin's best friend on the show and also worked for years as the director of Australia Zoo during filming the show. Backing up again to the early 80s, Bob and Lynn hired two full-time staff to help them manage more animals. Uh, their gamble with the rebranding expansion, you know, was paying off. More and more people coming to the park with more people, more money uh, through ticket sales. With that, they're able to expand the property from two acres to four acres now. Uh, now Steve's parents are able to begin a new project. They're well aware of the general public's intense hatred and fear of uh, giant saltwater crocodiles in far north Queensland, which I do understand. I mean, I share it. These motherfuckers, the males can grow in rare cases to over 21 feet long. 
can weigh up to around 3,000 pounds. That's a, that's a dinosaur. That's a dinosaur with a huge set of powerful jaws and so many sharp teeth. And these crocs, uh, opportunistic hunters that'll ambush their prey, uh, drown him, drown their prey or eat it whole. And they do this fucking crazy, crazy whip thing with their head that they'll sometimes like literally rip their prey in half, just the, the shearing force. Uh, it's an apex predator that will sometimes eat other apex predators. That is some alpha shit. Uh, they've even been witnessed eating sharks. In India, a saltwater croc was once witnessed killing and eating a fucking tiger, full-grown tiger. Crocs will eat all sorts of shit, including humans for sure. About two people a year on average get attacked and killed by saltwater crocs in Australia. Uh, their favorite food, koala bears. Yep, they like to toy with them. They'll play with them first. Uh, two crocs uh, recently witnessed tossing a little koala uh, back and forth with their mouths before one of them finally just, you know, ripped it in half and then they shared it. Or maybe that was never witnessed. Maybe I just like imagining people just horrified at that level of koala abuse. Uh, crocs will eat koalas, but don't seek them out. They're too little. They're, they'd rather go for like a kangaroo. A lot more meat. Anyway, the Irwins felt called to rescue big crocs who were deemed dangerous and were going to be killed. They wanted to capture, relocate these crocs to a conservation area to encourage education, reduce fear. Steve and Papa Bob fired up a backhoe, got to dig in some water holes to start a new uh, croc enclosure. Started building the zoo's future crocodile environmental park. 1985, Bob was recruited to be part of the brand new Queensland government's East Coast Crocodile Management Program. This is a government-sponsored project to reduce croc attacks by relocating them to less populated areas or sanctuaries. Biwa Park was one of the designated sanctuaries. The government received reports of nuisance crocodiles and called Bob and Steve to send them out to locations across Queensland. Bob and Steve worked together, wrestling crocs, removing them from populated areas before conflicts or dangerous situations arose. Eventually, Papa Bob will step away and Steve will work for the crocodile management program alone. He's younger, hungrier, has better wrestling moves. Bigger muscles, better moves. Pop croc hunter. Steve spends months in the bush searching for crocs and established himself as the best in Australia when it comes to capturing the largest and most dangerous saltwater crocs. Uh, Amer- Australia's top croc catcher. He's the Tom Brady, the Serena Williams, the Michael Jordan, the Ma Long of croc hunting. Who is Ma Long, you might ask? Uh, only the greatest fucking table tennis player of all time. For real. Ma Long, a.k.a. the dictator, a.k.a. the dragon. Two-time Olympic gold medalist from China. Three-time world championships champion. If you think you have a future in pro ping uh, ping pong, table tennis, look up Ma Long highlights on YouTube. And then a few minutes later when you're done, just throw your racket away. Go have a good cry and pick a new dream. Uh, By the late 80s, Steve had begun to record some of his croc hunting adventures using a video camera mounted on a tripod. This will, of course, eventually lead him to get his own TV show and then worldwide fame. Back it up a bit now. Uh, and, and by leading to the, you know, he's getting more and more, uh, f- you know, uh, familiar with being on camera, getting better at it. Uh, let's look at one of Steve's first solo croc hunting assignments, relocating a massive saltwater croc. In the sixties, word for first spread of a legendary massive crocodile living in a river system in North Queensland. This croc supposedly was sinking boats, tearing through fishing and, uh, uh, nets, you know, capture, capture nets was attacking and killing all sorts of animals, including pets, probably horses. Dragging carcasses across mudflats, just terrifying locals for over two decades. And saltwater crocs can live for a long time. They can live to around 70 years. And this one rumored to be 30 feet long, wider than a dinghy, with a head so big it could swallow a boar whole. Wasn't that big, but you know, there's fishing tails here. It's big, but not that big. Uh, the government sent, you know, professional croc catchers to the area numerous times over the years. They could never locate it. Well, 1985, Steve and his dad, you know, hear about this croc while working on some relocation projects. A couple years later, 87, they surveyed the croc's known territory. Then in 88, the government designates Steve and Papa Bob as caretakers of the croc's zone of the river system. They spent a, spent a while mapping out, exploring the area, looking for signs of the croc. And then later in, 18, in 1988, Steve captures this infamous crocodile by himself. He wrote about this experience uh, in his autobiography. He went on the uh, adventure with his dog, Chili. And he would write, let me get some uh, music to uh, set this to. Not really music, some, some, some sounds, some nature sounds. Several days later, Dad left me with faithful dog Chili in the Crocs territory. One man and one dog in the vast maze of mangroves pitted against the legend. I set two traps in the vicinity of the belly slide Dad had located. I set my biggest trap upstream from the belly slide in the area I considered the wildlife hotspot. Chili and I had become uh, part of the mangroves. Birds and wallabies accepted us as part of their everyday life. My stalking skills became very refined. Sometimes I'd squat for hours 
and the insect infected mangroves camouflage with leaves and mud is hoping to glimpse my target crocodile. I calculated that it was over 18 months since I had first anticipated catching this elusive old croc. Just as I was about to give up, I noticed meat missing from one of my traps. I stalked the crocodile for days after that. And then one morning on the river, the mangroves erupted a huge jolting force pounding the bow of the boat. Panic was pushing my eyeballs out. I must stay in control, I said. I snapped off a stick and tried to thread a top jaw rope between his massive yellow teeth. He lunged straight at me, ripping the stick and the uh, rope clean out of my hands. He snorted in blue mucus and sprayed it in my face. His eyes were wide, full of anger and fear. The croc exploded in a thrashing frenzy. He gripped the trap in his teeth and went to a series of violent death rolls. The instant he stopped, I positioned my top jaw rope stick, then jammed it in between those huge teeth and pushed it out the other side. Scampering between the aerial mangrove roots, I seized the rope. Before he had time to react, I sensed he was tired. I was able to tie the massive croc to a tree. I felt no fear. I was working on instinct. Sheer guts and determination was stamped into my brain. Crikey! I knew right then and there that I was the baddest motherfucker on earth. In a further display of dominance. I'm not going to lie. I fucked that croc. There was nothing sexual about it. It was about power. I needed to know that I, I ruled the land. That I could impose my will upon any predator at any time. When I was done, I bit off one of that fucker's toes. I ate it, swallowed it in front of him. I punched him in the fucking face, untied him and stared him down. I asked him, you want to fucking go, mate? No traps, no ropes. Just two beasts of the jungle, two kings in a fight to the death. He looked away, I'd broken his spirit. Now I said, leave now, for I break you in half and tell your friends. Tell them about the fucking croc hunter! Crikey! Ripper! I might have, I might have added those last things. That would have been pretty epic, though. Uh, maybe the last thing he wrote was sheer guts and determination were stamped in my brain. But he might have thought or felt some version of the rest because he was the king of the bush now. Uh, after Steve had the croc secured, he needed help getting it out. It was da- it damaged his boat and it was too heavy to carry with a small dinghy. He tracked down some locals, convinced them to help him out with lots of begging and cases of beer. Fuck yeah, bro. Maybe the most Australian thing I've ever heard. I need you guys to help me get a giant croc out of the water. Piss off, mate. You fucking mental. There's beer in it. All right, we're in. Where's that fucking toothy cunt? Uh, Steve said, eight burly farmers and myself were only just forced enough to lift the boat and croc up out of the water. Steve named the croc Agro and moved into his new home at the Australia Zoo. Steve felt both happy and sad. He removed a croc from his home and yes, maybe traumatized it in the process, but also saved it from death. He said, back at camp, I was sitting by the campfire, cuddling chilly, feeling empty and fearful for the croc's life. The capture of the big black legend was going to change him and me for the rest of our lives. Croc was big, but nowhere near 30 feet long again. It's half the size. People like to exaggerate. Uh, it was over 15 feet long, weighed over 1,300 pounds. Uh, Steve wrestled that son of a bitch down and uh, tied it to him free himself. Very impressive. Uh, let's jump ahead now to the 90s now. On October 4th, 1991, Steve's parents gave him full management of the Biwa Reptile and Fauna Park. I keep thinking of that Hell on Earth video. <laughs> Fucking guy killed me. There's more videos too, by the way. He still lives in Biwa and he still hates it so much. So still... <laughs> Those fucking scumbags. Uh, anyway, Bob and Lynn told Steve he'd uh, finally come of age. He was ready to take over responsibility managing the zoo, but ready to begin a, a partial retirement, but would still accompany Steve on many of his trips to catch and study wildlife. And it was a pretty easy transition of power. All the employees of the zoo respected and admired Steve because he never asked him to do anything he wouldn't do himself. Steve continued to lead the crocodile research program at the zoo and actively participated in it as, uh, as much as he could, as much as time allowed. Uh, two days later, October 6, 1991, Steve meets his future wife, 27-year-old Terry Rains, an American from Eugene, Oregon. Terry was a successful businesswoman, conservationist, before she ever met Steve. She was born July 20th, 1964 in Eugene, the youngest of three daughters born to Clarence and Judy Rains. Her parents owned a trucking business and also were dedicated environmentalists. Clarence often brought home uh, injured animals he found out in the road. From a young age, Terry loved animals, wanted to help him. By the age of 20, Terry was helping run the family business, also working part-time at an emergency vet hospital, also helping operate a local wildlife rehabilitation center called Cougar Country. She rehabilitated and released animals like cougars, bears, and bobcats, caring for over 300 animals each year. Terry was a fucking grinder. Hail Nimrod. She started working as a young teen, worked hard enough to buy her first home at the age of just 18. 
In October of 1991, now 27-year-old and single, Terry's on a vacation in Australia with some girlfriends. The gang first goes to Brisbane to visit some friends on the Sunshine Coast. Uh, uh, on the way back, one of uh, Terry's friends asks if she wants to stop and look at a little wildlife park on the side of the road. Terry decides, I'm never going to be here again. Why not? Within the hour, she's uh, stepping into the Queensland Reptile and Fauna Park and Biwa full of all those scumbags. Uh, Terry, was, Terry was impressed by the beautiful gardens and free-range animals. A few minutes later, she heard an announcement that a crocodile show was about to start. She was curious, you know, went to go watch. And, uh, you know, she was she was pretty impressed. She was impressed by the crocodiles, but more impressed by the handsome guy in the khaki uniform showcasing those tight, high, firm, juicy, bush booty buns. I may have added those last few words. Terry was interested in the way Steve talked about crocodiles with such love. Instead of talking about how he was skilled for handling the crocodiles, he continually emphasized how amazing the crocodiles were. It was about them, not him. Terry later wrote in her 2001 dual biography with Steve, uh, which we've quoted several quotes from already, uh, or pulled several, pulled several quotes from. She said, this was too incredible. Who was the man who spoke so casually of jumping into the water to wrestle crocodiles? He looked to be about my age, wasn't wearing a wedding ring, but surely this wonderful guy must have already been snapped up by some lucky girl. How could I possibly get a chance to talk to him anyway? As she was leaving, she and Steve locked eyes. It was as if we had always known each other. As I edged closer, he smiled and introduced himself as Steve Irwin. I bet he was quick to introduce himself. Uh, Terry's a smoke show. Uh, Steve described the first time he saw Terry in an interview. He said, when I saw Terry in the crowd, I looked up and our eyes met. My heart just went bang, bang, bang. I just, it just started thumping. It was love at first sight. Next thing I remembered uh, where I was, oh yeah, Agro was trying to kill me. <laughs> uh, months after the two started talking, they realized they shared the same passion for wildlife. Or sorry, not months, moments. Slight difference there. Moments after the two started talking. They were a match made in heaven. Steve was into reptiles. Terry was fascinated by mammalian predators. So very similar to Steve's parents, mammals and reptiles. Uh, as Terry was leaving, she realized she forgot to ask Steve if he had a girlfriend. Steve smiled and said that he did. Uh, then asked her if he wanted, if she wanted to meet his girlfriend, Terry was super bummed out just for a few seconds. Steve called for Suey, uh, and a dog came running up, running up. Suey would appear in a lot of episodes of the croc hunter. And he did love the shit out of that dog. Bojangles loves Steve Irwin. Uh, definitely can't think of a subject we've covered so far who has loved animals more than this guy. Before Terry left, Steve handed her a park brochure with his name and number written on it and said that, you know, sure hoped he would see her again soon. Terry called when she made it back down to Brisbane from a landline in those uh, ancient 20th century times. And she asked if she could come up and visit the park. And Steve told her to go fuck herself. He was very clear about having a girlfriend. Suey would tear her throat out if she ever returned. That's her territory. No, he invited her to stay for the weekend. Uh, and then Terry's friends dropped her off and she met Steve's whole family. Terry spent the next two days working at the zoo. She and Steve raked leaves, prepared food, cleaned enclosures. Uh, Terry was trying to impress him. Uh, she was sweating so much. Uh, she was worried she didn't look very pretty. Steve later said that their love went ballistic in those two days. And I first read that as a very sweet way of saying they worked all day with the animals and then fucked most of the night away like animals. Sounded like one hell of a weekend, but it was definitely a lot more innocent than that. Uh, for their first date, Steve brought Terry to, uh, oh, Caloundra. There we go. To Caloundra, a seafood buffet. He entertained her on the drive with stories of his adventures in the bush. While they were eating, Steve got a misty look in his eyes, she said later. Terry thought he was going to say something terribly romantic. Instead, he told her, gosh, you're not ladylike at all. He was thoroughly impressed by this. That was a big compliment from him. Much to Terry's disappointment, Steve did not kiss her at the end of the night, but he did promise to pick her up the next morning. Next, he took her to the romantic glass house mountains lookout. Terry was positive. He was uh, saving this spot for their first kiss, but instead he just talked a lot about all the landmarks. <laughs> Unfortunately for Terry, uh, Steve did not kiss her uh, until right before she left to go back home to the States. And I feel like that may have been his first kiss. The first time he kissed anyone. He just was interested in just animals until she uh, stole his heart. And that's not a put down. I love their love story. It's super adorable to me. Uh, Terry was heartbroken. When she had to leave, she exchanged phone numbers with Steve. You know, he said he'd try to come see her, but then he went weeks without calling. Terry was getting upset, but refused to be the one to call first. Then after a month, Steve just calls and goes, I'm coming over. I'll be there in 10 days. <laughs> Interesting guy. He didn't have time to call before that, Terry. Way too many crocs to wrestle. Way too many super venomous snakes to catch barehanded and shit. So Steve came to Oregon at the end of November, 1991. Didn't realize he was coming for the Thanksgiving holiday because, you know, it's not Australia's holiday. He uh, ends up meeting Terry's entire family and they fall in love with him right away. 
Steve spends 10 days in Oregon observing beavers, bears, and raccoons, working very hard not to make a crude and unnecessary joke about him spending most of his time on this trip with Terry's beaver. Trying not to say something, you know, unnecessary, like, Ripper, she's a beauty. Look at that pelt. Notice how aggressively and majestically she devours that wood. Crikey, what a beaver. Uh, January of 1992. Terry took a month-long vacation from work, travels back to Australia. Steve mostly took her crocodile hunting. Uh, of course he did. Terry realized he was falling in love with this maniac. Towards the end of the trip, Terry spends a day cutting down a tree with Steve. And when they sat down together at the end of the day, Steve just asked her, so what do you reckon? Do you want to get married? Love it. T- Terry immediately thought of so many reasons why they shouldn't get married, like having two different lives in two different countries. But she also knew she was uh, madly in love with him. So she said, yep, let's, let's get married. Uh, they spent the last few days of Terry's trip celebrating the proposal, trying to choose a wedding date. Terry started planning the wedding from February to June, 1992. Terry not only had to plan the wedding, she also had to make arrangements for her parents' business, right? For someone to take over her position, uh, to relocate all the wildlife at Cougar Country. So she'd been leaving that behind, leaving the whole country for Steve, leaving her whole life behind. Isn't it fucking wild how we meat sacks will often do that for love? What a leap of faith. She's only spent a few weeks with this guy you know, in person, like face to face. Now she's going to move to the other side of the world to be with him, leave behind her parents, siblings, friends, uh, the start of her own very successful career. And love is the most powerful drug there is. Uh, While Terry was stressing about the wedding, Steve had another reason to stress. A croc had bit him. Big croc named Graham. Kind of a funny name for a croc. (laughs) This is aggro. This is Graham. (laughs) Graham doesn't sound that aggressive. But, uh, you know, apparently it was. He bit him. Graham needed a new enclosure. His current space was too small for him. Took Steve and his uh, team three tries to lure him into a trap. On the third try, Graham did not go for the meat. Steve was dangling. He went a little further and got Steve's hand. Steve was rushed to the hospital with puncture wounds that went all the way through his hand. Uh, And experiences like that never made Steve think twice about not working with crocs and other dangerous predators the way he did. He just got stitched up, wrapped it up, blamed himself for not being more careful, went right back to work. Uh, June 4th, 1992, Steve and Terry get married in Eugene, Oregon at her grandma's church. Uh, Steve, I love this, was absolutely terrified. He later said that the wedding was the single scariest moment of his entire life, that he was dripping sweat and literally shaking. He said, I would sooner take on a 16 foot crocodile uh, strike than getting married. I bet I know why. I bet he was worried that getting married would take away from him being able to head out into the bush whenever he wanted, you know, go chase animals around, just live free like he had. But Terry would never do that to him. She loved wildlife just as much as he did. Still does. Over 400 people attended the wedding, said their goodbyes to Terry. It was a big emotional affair. Uh, Terry was excited to begin her new life in Australia. She later described her marriage as 14 years of the most adventurous time of my life. Terry and Steve, of course, uh, did not have a traditional honeymoon or even really a honeymoon at all. They did plan on going on a honeymoon, but then Steve received a call at the last minute about a group of poachers hunting, of course, crocodiles in far North Queensland. Steve was asked if he could catch those crocs and transplant them before they got killed. A film crew would also document the whole thing with, uh, you know, future conf- future conservation efforts in mind, possible documentary. Steve asked Terry what she wanted to do, and she said she wanted to save the crocodiles. So match made in heaven. So they canceled their honeymoon and spend what was going to be their honeymoon filming crocodiles, other Australian wildlife in far North Queensland, uh, cameraman John Stanton filmed the, filmed the event. Director, soundman, zoo employee, Wes Mannion, you know, also accompanied them. And the footage will then later become the first pilot episode of The Crocodile Hunter. Uh, sadly, Terry and Steve were, were not able to save the male crocodile they set out to find, but they were able to find its female mate and relocate her. During the capture, Steve asked Terry to assist him in sitting on the crocodile. She said she was terrified, but still did it. Terry will later say in interviews that one of the things she loved most about Steve was that he never assumed that she couldn't do something, that he believed in her and encouraged her constantly. So hail Lucifina. Over the next four years, they will film 15 different wildlife documentaries all over the Australian bush. Terry wrote in a 2001 biography, I didn't fully appreciate then that this was just the beginning. Over the following years, Steve and I would spend about half our lives in the bush. We didn't realize just how well received our wildlife documentaries would be. After the wedding, Terry took over as manager of their business, conservation projects. Steve and Terry's work brought their small zoo to the world stage. Their emphasis on animal welfare and conservation was so unique. You know, of course it stood out. Terry wrote again in 2001, Steve and I also operate the Australia Zoo with a philosophy that might not seem to make the best business sense. Since 1970, the Irwin family has maintained a strict policy that the needs of our animals come first, our team will come second, and our visitors rank third. 
With incredibly happy and healthy animals, our team has higher morale and overwhelming passion for their work. Patrons of Australia Zoo win too because they experience our enthusiastic team and zoo animals as they've never seen them before. I love that. Uh, Steve and Terry immediately started working on their endangered species unit, which provided habitat for endangered animals to allow them to breed successfully. That project also gave researchers a valuable chance to study these animals. As part of Steve's crocodile catching work, he was hired as a consultant for a TV commercial also in 1992. And uh, when he showed some of his honeymoon tapes to a producer at Australia's Channel 10 network, they were excited. The producer immediately suggested they turn the tapes into a documentary. The results of that meeting uh, would be 10 hours of footage titled The Crocodile Hunter, which first aired in 1992 in Australia. It would not make its way in a, a more edited form to the animal planet for another four years. The success of the TV program, the Australian viewers loved it, led to, as, as I mentioned before, many more documentaries, uh, some featuring international expeditions, it brought much more attention, more dollars with it to the Irwin's Queensland Reptile and Fauna Park. Later in 1992, Steve and Terry renamed the park Australia Zoo. Make it sound bigger because it was. Over the following years, they will turn the zoo into a major tourist attraction that it still is today. They first expanded the park from four to 16 acres, then to 550 acres by 2000. Uh, and the park had, uh, you know, over a thousand animals. And now today it's over 700 acres. The Irwins will also use their new exposure and successful zoo to found wildlife warriors worldwide in 2002, an international organization that continues to promote worldwide conservation, education, and research. The Irwins did a lot more than catch crocs, right? They stayed busy. One of Stephen Terry's first joint projects was determining the ancestry of Harriet, a giant tortoise. This shit, this shit blew my mind coming across this. They estimated that this tortoise, this big fucking turtle, uh, had been brought to Australia 130 years earlier on a whaling ship. This thing's still alive. It was common back then for whalers to take tortoises as food sources on their long journeys. Uh, they believed Harriet somehow managed to become a pet before ending up uh, at the City Botanic Gardens in Brisbane around 1900. They believed this until Scott Thompson, a tortoise expert, came to the zoo and told them that Harriet was a different species of tortoise entirely. Scott had previously found a preserved tortoise at the Queensland Museum in Brisbane. The, the tortoise was upside down in a storage warehouse. The words Tom Giant or Tom Dash Giant Galapagos Land Tortoise died 1929, Brisbane Botanic Gardens. That was all carved into the shell. Uh, this was a tortoise from an old newspaper article reporting that three tortoises had been brought to Australia in 1841 from the Brisbane Botanic or for the Brisbane Botanic Gardens. Two died in the 1920s, and then they all believed that Harriet was the still living third tortoise. And yeah, you're hearing all these dates correctly. This thing was over 150 years old. These fuckers can live to around 200 years old in captivity and become huge, like close to a thousand pounds huge. I had no idea that A, turtles could get that big and that B, they could, they could live anywhere near that long, like this species. These tortoises were collected and studied in 1835 by Charles Darwin. So if Harriet was truly the third tortoise, she was the oldest giant land tortoise in the world. Uh, she had spent time with Charles Darwin and then with the croc hunter, which is hard for me to mentally process. And they, yeah, Harriet likely was that third tortoise. She would live to be an estimated 175 years old. She would die in 2006. She would be shot to death by Terry after Terry suspected her of sleeping with Steve. Numerous Australian zoo animals killed over the years before Steve passed due to Terry's uh, insane jealousy. Overall, a wonderful conservationist, but just um, had a temper and very jealous. No, JK, you knew that. Uh, no, Harriet died of being 170 fucking five years old. My God. Uh, the couple's next big project was transferring Charlie to a new enclosure. Uh, Charlie was an 11 foot, 700 pound crocodile. Better, better croc name than Graham. Uh, Queensland, a Queensland aquarium had no room for him, asked for a transfer to the zoo. Steve had to construct a new special enclosure for Charlie. Uh, mature male crocodiles can't live together. They'll fight sometimes to the death. And Charlie was too aggressive to even live with the female crocs. Fucking naughty ass Charlie. They had to barricade a section of a pond for him. Then after the enclosure was completed, the team had to figure out how to remove Charlie from the aquarium. Steve was anti-sedation, didn't want to risk killing it, uh, harming the animal that way. So they have to wrestle him out. Steve left a skeleton crew behind at the zoo, got his main team to come to him with the aquarium or come with him to the aquarium. Steve climbed into the enclosure, secured the first jaw rope on Charlie. This irritated the crocodile. Yeah, probably doesn't like having a rope in his mouth. He started to fight with Steve. Old buddy Wes Mannion jumped into the enclosure, distracted the croc. Charlie spun around, now tried to kill Wes. Steve secured the second jaw rope. Once he was secured, Terry and 10 other staff jumped into the enclosure. When Steve gave the signal, 11 people, right, just pinned down Charlie to keep him still, then slid him into a box and drove him home. Easy peasy. Just another normal workday. 
November 1993. Uh, Bob, Lynn, Steve, Terry, and Steve's dog, Sui, or Sui, travel into the jungle of Cape York Peninsula to capture two pairs of unidentified goannas. They capture the pairs in less than a week. Months later, they bred the goannas in their special canopy goanna breeding facility, studied the pairs, got a bunch of data, released them back into the wild. Uh, that work was important to the discovery of a new species of lizard. And that was the completion of that project Steve and his, his dad, Papa Bob, had started back in 1980. 1994, Steve received an increased number of reports by park rangers at the Old Faithful Waterhole in Wakefield National Park, popular fishing and camping area, of a 14-foot croc swimming near and approaching people in boats and campsites. Another assignment for the croc hunter. Uh, before I talk about it, uh, how about a bit more context on who is calling Steve to handle this? Uh, shooting crocodiles was legal in Australia until 1974, then banned due to extinction concerns. After the ban in 74, populations went back up, which was great, but then that led to a lot more problems between humans and crocs. Crocs are uh, Australia's you know, apex predator, in particular saltwater crocodiles. Australia has just two species of crocs, saltwater and freshwater crocs. Uh, the freshwater croc, uh, also known as uh, freshie, as I mentioned earlier, as the Australian freshwater crocodile, sometimes called Johnstone's crocodile. They're endemic to Australia, only found in northern Australia. Uh, a lot smaller than saltwater cousins, as I mentioned, you know, males can grow to uh, almost 10 feet in length, weigh up to about around 150 pounds. Females can reach uh, about seven feet in length, weigh around 90 pounds. Saltwater crocs can be found in many parts of India, Sri Lanka, Southeast Asia, all around Indonesia, the Philippines, Australia, numerous other nations in the South Pacific, and, you know, much, much bigger. Males can, as I mentioned, you know, reach over 21 feet in length, weigh 300 or weigh 3000 pounds. Females a lot smaller, topping out at around 10 feet long and 330 pounds. And a crocodile's only predator, other crocodiles. And humans, of course. I mean, thanks to our opposable thumbs and technical know-how, we are the world's true apex predator. If we have our tech handy, if naked, advantage croc. Naked croc versus naked human uh, without access to weapons. Slam dunk victory for crocs. Uh, 1985, Queensland's National Parks and Wildlife, later named the Department of the Environment or Department of Environment, established the East Coast Crocodile Management Program to save crocs. And people would now report problem crocodiles to this agency. And then this agency, you know, initially after reports came in, uh, you know, their rangers would go to investigate them. And these rangers would trap and relocate crocs. They would move them from one wild territory to another. But Steve didn't like that. After years of relocating crocodiles, Steve noticed that moving a large dominant male will allow smaller, less dominant males to move in, which upsets the traditional crocodile family structure, leads to a lot of instability, leads to a lot of crocs fighting, killing one another. Also releasing a big male into an unknown location causes conflicts with existing crocs there, leading to more croc deaths. Steve wanted to come up with a new technique, which he was going to try out in the Wakefield National Park, right, where there have been a lot of reports of crocodile concerns. And, uh, you know, this department would now end up calling Steve for a lot of their most difficult cases. Steve wrote, the actual truth of this so-called nuisance behavior is that the poor old croc was just inquisitive of the people in his territory. He never, ever had a go at anyone or demonstrated any aggressive behavior towards people. I guess when a huge crocodile head looking like a dinosaur pops up near your camp or boat, it's quite intimidating. I do not understand why park visitors were complaining about him. Looking at people crashing around in your territory is hardly nuisance behavior. Steve was asked to try out his alternative management strategy to, uh, to, you know, alleviate fears around this croc. He was going to capture, hold, and then harass the croc for a short period of time, then release the croc back into the original water hole. The intention here is to teach the croc to be scared of people. If successful, it will maintain the natural environment, not lead to croc on croc violence and reduce interactions between crocodiles and people. So smart idea. Also, uh, weird and darkly funny to me. Like Steve is literally being hired to capture and just harass a croc. Before reading about his actual techniques, I, I, I imagine this getting so weird. Like I pictured like Steve, like wrestling a croc into a cage and then like forcing a big fucking baby bonnet on the, on the croc's head. And then like making it wear like baby clothes, like a big onesie, a diaper, silly little shoes, bunch of little doilies on everything. Maybe a bib too, you know, why not? Then this, he and a bunch of people surround its cage, just taunting, laughing. Look at this fucking baby. What a baby croc. You're going to cry, you stupid fucking cunt baby croc ripper. Shit your nappy, you fucking ankle-biting twat. You let a man wrestle you down, you weak sissy croc twat baby crikey cunt. Whatever. The, I, I just picked the croc just laying down, just defeated, just tears flowing down his cheeks. And then when they release it, it's just so embarrassed and ashamed, just never seen by humans again. Okay, now let's talk about what actually happened. Steve, Terry, uh, West Mannion, you know, the DOE Rangers, uh, other zoo employees set up two traps using Steve and Papa Bob's designs from the early 80s. 
They anchored the traps to large trees with rope and bait secured by a short rope with a splice loop over the trigger mechanism. Any pulling on the bait releases the trigger. Uh, weighted bags then fall, pull the mouth of the trap closed. They barricade the sides of these traps with logs, branches, other foliage. Uh, so the only way the croc can get that bait and get that meat is to go through the entrance. Uh, one night, two, uh, two uh, nights after the traps were set, just a few minutes before midnight, Steve hears the rush of plummeting weight bags and the trapping triggered pierce the stillness of the night. Steve knew it would not be safe to approach until morning, so he waited. At 6 a.m., sure enough, there's that big-ass croc. Uh, he places jaw ropes around the trapped croc so it can't open its jaws, secures the croc, says, uh, despite his numerous bursts of aggression and struggle, while I tried to secure top jaw ropes, Old Faithful never made any attempts to bite me. Even when I was working close to his head, I am amazed and in awe of this pristine modern-day dinosaur's reluctance to kill me. Steve and Terry then spent the afternoon circling around the croc in two dinghies uh, to show him the noises of boats and people. They're, they're yelling at him. The, the croc's getting very agitated. The crew camps around the crocodile so he can see and smell people in close proximity. The croc seems frightened. Uh, they harass the croc at night, you know, with uh, spotlights. They're yelling at him again. Steve stalks close to him, you know, fires gun uh, the gun into the water around him, terrifying the croc. 6.30 a.m. the next day, eight people straddle and restrain the croc for 15 minutes. Barely puts up a fight, which showed that he understood that humans were stronger, more dominant. When they released him, he slowly walked into the water, then swam the fuck away from all of them. And then the campground reopens. Uh, Steve would come back periodically over the following months to observe the same crocodile. And the croc showed you know, sufficient signs of human shyness. Wanted nothing to do with humans after all that harassment. So Steve's innovative technique had worked. That's pretty badass. Also, I love that the, uh, the croc hunter was the croc harasser. Better techniques, sadder crocs. Papa fucks with dinosaurs. Uh, 1996, American TV channel Animal Planet now picks up the Crocodile Hunter, which skyrockets the show's popularity. It'll be syndicated soon worldwide. At its peak of popularity, the Crocodile Hunter will air in over 200 countries. Uh, but that first season uh, wasn't really a season. It was just a standalone two-hour documentary, later split into two quote-unquote hour-long episodes for reruns. Uh, the true season one will air in 1997, eight hour long episodes 1998 season two will also feature eight episodes season three really more like two seasons 16 episodes split over 1999 and 2000 season four 18 episodes split up over three years the end of 2000 through 2002 season five 12 episodes aired between the end of 2002 and 2005 and then there would be 13 different standalone specials the last airing on the uh, year anniversary of his death in 2007 hundreds of millions of people worldwide will watch his show uh, people were spellbound by Steve's dangerous encounters with animals. I mean, I was one of them. I was fascinated. I was like, what the fuck is this guy doing? I honestly couldn't believe a croc didn't kill him in season one. Uh, he interacted with all kinds of traditionally scary animals like snakes, spiders, and you know, lizards in addition to, to crocs. Uh, he used the show to further his lifelong pursuit of educating others about wildlife. The dangerous predators aren't as dangerous if you know how to avoid them, how to interact with and not interact with them. Mosey taught me to stay away from them. I had zero interest. Back before watching the show in Feeding a Croc, say some raw meat. And following watch the show, still zero interest. Uh, Steve's enthusiastic pers personality allowed him to captivate audiences, you know, get them excited about wildlife. For many, he changed the perception of traditionally ugly and scary animals like crocs, snakes, and lizards. He used the show to teach audiences that all living things have a purpose on our planet and that we should care about all of them. One of Steve's zoo staff said in an interview for the 2018 documentary, The Steve Irwin Story, at first you think, is he crazy? But the reality is what he was doing is showing equality in the animal world. And he brought that to the forefront, especially in highlighting the apex predator, the crocodile, which everyone was taught to fear. I wonder about that. Like, were we taught to fear them? Or do we just instinctively fear creatures like the croc that legitimately have no problem eating us? <laughs> because many of our ancestors have in fact been eaten by them. I mean, I am all for crocodile preservation. I mean, truly, 100%. Also, uh, I am for continuing to be logically scared of truly scary animals. But Steve, who I have to admit, you know, before he passed, had forgotten more about crocs than I'll ever know, you know, disagreed. In one episode of The Crocodile Hunter, Steve got close to a group of crocodiles and told his audience, incredible stuff. I'm not being threatened. They're not an evil, ugly monster that just waits to kill man. In fact, there's millions of people on the continent of Africa that share the territory of this magnificent species every single day. Steve loved his work so much that he was known for saying, this is the best day of my life. Almost every day. Which is pretty cute. But also, if I worked with someone like that and I was not in the best mood, maybe a little tired, maybe a little irritable, that'd be annoying as fuck. This is the best day of my life. 
Oh, would you shut up? You have said that every fucking day since I've met you and I've known you for a couple years. Learn what the word best means, my friend. Stop tossing around like a dickhead. Your truck broke down this morning. It's raining. You told me earlier that you think that something in your breakfast gave you a case of mild food poisoning. This is an average day at best, not a best day. Uh, with Steve, though, he really did do what he loved. So I don't know. Maybe he did have a lot of, you know, best days. As the show got more and more popular, Steve made sure not to deviate from his classic uniform. Khaki shirt and shorts. He used his signature catchphrase, crikey, as often as he could. He knew what he was doing. This would be highly beneficial for him. All right? It was good branding. The Steve Irwin brand spawned countless books and merchandise, which made the Irwins millions. Steve's image and personality was so iconic, he was parodied on shows like South Park, uh, Simpsons, you know, Saturday Night Live. Steve loved that SNL did a skit about him. Never took himself too seriously, enjoyed a good joke at his expense. So many stand-up comics, oh my God, so many had Croc Hunter impressions for several years. Some close to the Croc Hunter felt Steve was so popular because he was the same person on and off screen. It was authentic. People felt like they were really part of his life and adventures. His passion was real. In 2004, he told Larry King, I believe that the time has come when if we don't get animals into people's hearts, they're going to go extinct. We're running out of time right now. I mean, his life definitely was driven by a strong sense of purpose, and I do love that. Uh, Steve's show was revolutionary because instead of observing wildlife from a safe distance, he brought the camera you know, as close as possible. His audience watched him interact with, often touch, wrestle with dangerous wildlife. Steve said in an interview, it's just that I've got to be, I've got to get the camera. I've got to be right in there. I have to get right in there, smack into the action because this day has come where the audience need to come with me and be there with the animal. Gone are the days of sitting back in the long lens and the tripod and looking at wildlife way over there. No, come with me, share it with me, share my wildlife with me because humans want to save things that they love. My job, my mission, the reason I've been put on this planet is to save wildlife. Pretty intense, man. It's pretty awesome. The show and Steve, uh, really, they were uh, one of the same. Uh, also was not without critics. Many people thought Steve was acting irresponsibly around wildlife by approaching, handling dangerous animals. But those who knew him best said that these people, and I'll admit I was one of them before this episode, I thought he was a fucking lunatic, also, th- also thought he was super reckless because they just didn't understand his upbringing and immense experience with wildlife. They didn't realize that he truly had extensive knowledge of animal behavior. He knew what he could and could not do around certain animals. So his risks were very calculated. Terry later said about her husband, I never got tired of watching things connect so beautifully with Steve. It was a gift more than a skill. It was that ability to read animals and understand them. And I think we won't ever see that again. Also, Steve understood showmanship. He knew that without the close encounters, no way people were going to get as excited and interested in the show as they did. He was known for saying, I believe that education is all about being excited about something. That's the main aim of our entire lives is to promote education about wildlife and wilderness areas and save habitats, save endangered species, etc., So if we can get people excited about animals, then by crikey, it makes it a heck of a lot easier to save them. I get that. I'm not taking any physical risk recording podcasts, but I do want people to be curious about the world around them. I want people to enjoy learning, to keep uh, wanting to learn, to think more critically and more often, because I do firmly believe that the more of us who do that, uh, the more consistently we do that, the better the world will be for everyone. And part of what I love about the challenge of Time Suck, you know, the non-true crime episodes anyway, is to try and figure out how to convey a lot of information about a subject that might not normally come across uh, as interesting to many people, might come across as, as boring, and then make it fun and memorable through, you know, weaving in some ridiculous humor. humor. Uh, Steve knew how to make memorable content. My God, he knew how to make education exciting. And because Steve could do that so well, you know, he and the family made a lot of money. How much Steve and Terry were making from the show and merchandise and extra visitors to the zoo, or the exposure has brought them, you know, it's never been made public, but we can assume it was a considerable amount. And because they made so much money, Steve and Terry decided to put all the money from film and merchandise sales specifically back into conservation. They established the Australia Zoo Wildlife Hospital. In 2004, Steve dedicated the wildlife hospital to his mother. The hospital started off as an avocado packing shed and is now a world-class facility focused on reaching and rehabilitating over 7,000 animals a year. Okay, now let me get back into dates. I shot, I shot ahead a bit. Uh, I was last 1996 talking about the pilot episode of The Croc Hunter getting picked up. Let's jump back in at 1997. That year, Steve and Papa Bob discovered a new species of turtle while on one of their, of course, croc hunting expeditions. They named it Irwin's Turtle, a rare species of freshwater turtle found in northern Queensland. 1997, Steve and Terry discussed having kids for the first time in their six years of marriage. Steve came running inside one evening and just told Terry, we've got to have children. <laughs> uh, what inspired him, this will probably not surprise you, he couldn't bear the thought of leaving the zoo behind with no one to take care of it. It's all about the animals. 
Uh, when Terry tried to tell him, uh, you know, that their kids might not be interested in wildlife, Steve beat the fucking shit out of her. He dragged her down to where they kept the crocodiles. He put her in an enclosure with Agro, their biggest croc. And he started yelling, take it back, Terry. Take it bloody back. Our kids will fucking love crocs. You will guarantee me this or you will be eaten. You will disappear, Terry. I will find another lady mare to carry my man brood. And she will be the one to give me baby croc hunters who will grow up fearless and strong. You will honor your croc master, Terry. Or Agro will fucking end you. Uh, so either that happened. Or Steve just insisted their future kids would take on efforts when he retired and continue running the Australia Zoo and he was just, you know, had a good feeling about it. Uh, dude had no shortage of confidence in what he wanted out of life. Uh, Terry agreed to give it a go and soon found out that she was pregnant after coming home from a trip to America. Uh, yeah, there we go. Steve spent the next few hours on the phone telling everyone the big news. Uh, July 24th, 1998, Bindi Sue Irwin, born in Queensland. When Terry called to tell Steve she was in labor, he was two and a half hours away filming. He rushed over, dropped what he was doing, uh, brought the camera crew with him to capture it all. I picture him approaching his wife like he'd approach a croc in the wild, right, with that camera crew. Just in this hallway, looks an adult female human who I'm intimately familiar with. It's Terry Irwin. We must approach her with extreme caution or she will crack the sheets. Women in labor can be incredibly aggressive and hostile especially when they have specifically forbidden you to film the birth of your child. Oh, there she is. She doesn't see us. Just quietly get a shot of the vaginal region so you don't miss the baby crowning his little head out. Looks like she may be defecating right now. Totally natural with all that pushing. Zoom in on that. We'll use that for some bloopers. Crikey, look at that dilation. Just incredible. Ripper. What a beauty. Uh, seriously, now the couple had not discussed names before. But Steve told her, uh, told Terry that if they had a daughter, he really wanted to name her Bindi, an aboriginal word for young girl. And also, I know this is shocking, the name of one of his favorite crocs. <laughs> it's all about crocs, this guy. Uh, her middle name was to be Sue, named after his dog, Suey. Again, not kidding. Never read about someone more obsessed with animals. Uh, Bindi will go on her first expedition when she is just six days old and will appear, appear on the show when she's just a few weeks old. Steve and Terry will face criticism uh, from not just some of the general public, but also from friends and family for taking her out on their adventures when she's so young and they didn't care. They definitely live life on their own terms. Uh, fatherhood uh, brought out Steve's sensitive side. Check out this clip of him talking about his little girl. Uh, allergy warning on this one. There is some kind of pollen or something attached to the audio. I don't know. It might make your eyes feel funny uh, for a second when you watch it. I never, you know what? I never wanted to be a dad. I couldn't really give a rip. And now I am the proudest father, I gotta tell you. I thought you were gonna be a boy. I just, I, I can't dwell on her for too long or I start bawling my eyes out. When I go into the field, mate, I got a photo. I got a photo of me and my daughter and I can just <laughs> sit there and just start crying, just looking at her. Who would have thought someone as ugly as me could bring into the world so, something so beautiful, such a treasure. And so, you know, I've been asked about philosophies of fatherhood and, you know, how to be a good parent and all that. And to tell you the truth, mate, all I do is just treat her exactly how I would want to be treated. She wants to have chocolate. Mum's not looking. Here, have the whole block. <laughs> I do love that. Uh, Steve will say in multiple interviews before his death that if he was to be remembered for anything, I know he said he wants to be remembered for passion and enthusiasm, but also he wanted to be remembered for being a, a great father. Uh, Steve would be right with his prediction for his kids. As soon as she could walk and talk, Bindi expressed interest in wildlife. As a child, she'll star in her own show, Bindi, the Jungle Girl. It'll air on Australia's Discovery Kids Network in 2007, 2008. Uh, she'll go on to act in several movies like Nim's Island and Free Willy, Escape from Pirate's Cove. Uh, starting in 2018, she, her brother, and their mom, Terry, have starred in a reality show for Animal Planet called Crikey, It's the Irwins. Uh, his future son, also a big name in conservation now. Steve's future son. Uh, February 11, 2000, some tragedy strikes the Irwin family. Steve's mom, Lynn, dies suddenly and unexpectedly in a car crash, in a car crash at the age of 57. Only info I can find out about it uh, just says it was a single vehicle accident. Steve, of course, is devastated. Months later, he tells Terry he wants another baby. Lynn's death made him realize his own mortality, reaffirmed his, his desire uh, to have children continue his work. He wanted a boy this time. Uh, doesn't want to get to choose, but whatever. Uh, Terry spoke to nutritionists about a special diet that had the potential to influence a child's sex. The baby boy diet had strict rules. No dairy, low calcium, no nuts, shellfish, or chocolate. Uh, a doctor also recommended that Steve avoid overheating his bits. 
Uh, this is all believed, uh, by the way, by the overwhelming majority of Western doctors uh, to be superstitious nonsense. No diet has ever been proven to conclusively increase or decrease the odds of having a boy or a girl. And it doesn't matter how hot your nets get when it comes to determining gender. Uh, it does matter, little secret, little pro tip, if you twist them or not. If you really want a boy, if you're fucking serious, well, if you're willing to pay the price, then you got to twist your nuts clockwise. Two full rotations before you ejaculate. Guaranteed boy, if you can do that. If. Most people will pass out before they even make it to the second twist. So, give it a shot. Hoping everyone knows I just made that up. But also kind of hoping someone maybe misses the part where I said making it, making it up. And, uh, you know, I get an email about how it worked out. 2002, Steve and Terry stars themselves now in the film The Crocodile Hunter Collision Course. This is an actual movie. Does all right at the box office. $33.4 million against a $12 million budget. This movie will win Best Family Feature Film for a comedy at the Young Artist Awards. The film features Steve and Terry attempting to save a crocodile from poachers, not knowing that the two men are really American CIA agents who are after them because the crocodile in Irwin's possession has accidentally swallowed a very important satellite tracking beacon. And I love that looking through the comments under the trailer, some people who watched this movie when they were kids actually thought it was still a documentary, like all the other Croc Hunter stuff. So they truly believed for a good chunk of their childhood that Steve and Terry were just trying to keep the CIA away from hurting a crocodile and getting caught up in a bunch of crazy hijinks along the way. <laughs> uh, Steve and Terry also started a few other shows, Croc Files from 1999 to 2001, Crocodile Hunter Diaries from 2002 to, two, uh, uh, from 2000 to 2002, I flipped the numbers, um, uh, a new breed New Breed Vets, excuse me, in 2005, all were a similar documentary style as uh, The Crocodile Hunter. That same year, Steve and Terry started the Steve Irwin Conservation Foundation, later renamed Wildlife Warriors that I mentioned earlier. This organization will go on to purchase hundreds of square miles all over the world to protect native animal species. December 1st, 2003, Steve's second child, Robert Clarence Irwin, is born. That diet worked, apparently. Or maybe he twisted his nuts two times clockwise. Uh, Terry's water broke in the 30th. She woke Steve up, told him she was in labor, but uh, that he could go back to sleep for a few hours. Steve came to her bedside and said, I'm putting my foot down. This baby's going to be named Robert Clarence Irwin if it's a boy. Terry told him, go fuck yourself. She said, if you really wanted to name a baby, then he could figure out how to get himself pregnant and push that baby out of his dick hole. No, she was fine with that name. They both liked it. Uh, they named their son Robert after Steve's dad. Today, Robert works at the family zoo, enjoys wildlife photography in his free time, also makes guest appearances on stuff like The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon. January 2nd, 2004, baby Bobbert gets his dad into some trouble. The most controversy the Croc Hunter would get into. Stupid baby. Uh, Steve faced the most criticism of his career for bringing one-month-old Robert into a crocodile enclosure during feeding time. I remember this. Steve held Robert under one arm while he fed a dead chicken to Murray. <laughs> Another weird croc name. 13-foot crocodile using his other arm. He walked the baby around the enclosure while crowds watched. Terry received a message later that day that a local TV channel has crit was criticizing Steve. Then more criticism, much more flowed in. She later wrote in 2007, the story had gone out all over the world. Steve was portrayed as an evil, ugly monster who had, who had exploited his son in some kind of stunt show. I felt as though the mob was going to be outside our gates with lighted torches. News helicopters hovered over the zoo trying to get a video of the family after this. Uh, Terry later said, I stood by Steve's side and watched his heart break. I have seen Tasmanian devils battle over a carcass. I've seen lionesses crowding a kill, dingoes on the trail of a feral piglet, an adult croc thrashing its prey to pieces, but never in all the animal world have I witnessed anything to match the casual cruelty of the human being. <laughs> Powerful quote. Uh, police officers stopped by their house that night. Steve had to call the governor general secretary who informed him he would be investigated by children's services. She warned him that they had the ability to take his children away from him. Steve made a public statement assuring everyone that Robert was never in any danger. He explained that he wanted his children to have the same experience he did growing up surrounded by beautiful wild animals. He said, I was in complete control of the crocodile. Robert was tucked right in my arm. The Queensland State Families Department investigated him for the potential breach of workplace safety regulations, but Steve did manage to avoid any charges. Family and children's groups all over Australia called him reckless and irresponsible. Terry McEnroth, acting premier of Queensland State, told the public... They claim that the child was not in danger. They understand people's concerns and have assured children's services that it will not happen again. Steve never made an apology for the incident. According to Terry, for him to say, I'm sorry, would mean he was sorry that Bob and Lynn had raised him the way that they did. And that was simply impossible. The best he could do was to sincerely apologize if he had worried anyone. The reality was that he would have been remiss as a parent if he didn't teach his kids how to coexist with wildlife. And then Steve never did uh, something like that again that we're aware of at least. Uh, I love this guy. 
And I'm glad he taught his, uh, you know, kids to coexist with wildlife, dangerous wildlife. But with a month old baby, come on, that is reckless. Uh, baby boy can wait until he's, uh, you know, maybe no longer a literal baby to get comfy with uh, dangerous predators, can he? I mean, I mean, this is even dumber to me than Steve's dad taking him out to hunt snakes when Steve is seven and not warning him about, uh, you know, the world's most venomous snakes being in the area. But what, you know, everybody makes mistakes. Uh, June, 2004, Steve was investigated again, this time for allegedly filming too close to humpback whales and penguins in Antarctica. Antarctica. Uh, Steve phone interviewed with Australian broadcast channels. Jeez, I'm back up. Steve interviewed with Australian broadcast channels, local radio show to clear the air. Steve said he did nothing wrong, but enjoyed the attention the controversy brought to his show. He and his crew had gone to Antarctica in February, 2004 to film. The hour long documentary was going to be called Icebreaker. But Australian law states visitors must stay five meters away from seals and penguins at all times. Swimming with whales, also banned. Steve was accused of breaching his permit and federal authorities wanted to take a closer look. Steve called the entire incident a big storm in a teacup. According to him, a ship saw him from a mile and a half away, mistakenly reported that he was riding a whale, (laughs) which would have been pretty badass if he could have done that. Steve told the radio show, oh, total beat up, Mike. Like I'm tobogganing over there. There's penguins over there. And that's a big deal. I mean, I, I don't know what they're really going on about. I really don't. I don't understand that one at all. When asked about swimming with whales, he said, eh, that's not true. That's false. That's just not on. Um, I'm sitting on an iceberg, bobbing around in the middle of the ocean and the whales. I mean, their environment, mate, and they're going around me. And, and as the International Whaling Convention's general principle states, they do what they want and they leave when they want. How's this? The whales, I got back on board because I'm starting to go into hypothermia because I've got so much water in my supposed dry suit. I'm starting to die. So I get back on the boat and the whales just keep coming around. It's all there. It's all in the vision. Steve was facing a million dollar fine up to two years in jail for this. But then after the Australian Department of Environment viewed the tape, uh, they cleared him of all charges. And if you're wondering why is the Australian government uh, investigating something that happened, you know, in Antarctica, I was wondering the same thing. Well, because from their point of view, uh, this actually happened in Australia because I did not know this, but Australia claims to own 42% of Antarctica. Seven countries, Argentina, Australia, Chile, France, New Zealand, Norway, and the UK maintain territorial claims in Antarctica. But the US and most other countries, the vast majority of countries around the world do not recognize these claims. Only four other countries, New Zealand, the UK, France, and Norway recognize Australia's claim to sovereignty in Antarctica. In Antarctica. Currently, no one really cares that much about anyone's claims in Antarctica because it's a frozen fucking wasteland that no one's willing to go to war to fight over. I mean, the continent has no permanent residents, just teams of researchers and a few people who work on some kind of tracking, satellite tracking stations uh, who rotate in and out. Uh, I just found it pretty interesting that Australia is like, just so everyone knows, about half of Antarctica, that's all shit. All right. Uh, January 2006, Steve made a famous appearance on The Tonight Show with Jay Leno. His appearance on The Tonight Show was his first time handling a King Cobra. Steve also appeared on The Oprah Show in 2006 to hug and kiss a crocodile named Bubba. Uh, <laughs> he'd already brought a uh, brought a 22-foot python onto Conan in 2004. I, I, I cry laughed watching a video of that appearance. Uh, things went pretty sideways. When Steve traveled to America for talk show appearances, it was, it was the first time uh, you know he'd be in big cities experiencing luxury hotels with room service. I love that. He was a huge, insanely famous international celebrity by the time 2004 rolled around for that Conan appearance, uh, had never had room service. July of 2006, Steve is the happiest he has ever been, and Mr. Best Day Ever uh, had always been pretty damn happy. He was happily married, had two beautiful kids. Uh, he and Terry had just finished their 10-year plan for the zoo. He had you know, more plans to leave home to film uh, yet another documentary, this one on Queensland's Bat Reef. Yet another adventure on his long list of adventures. Uh, back in 2001, Steve had hosted a special called The 10 Deadliest Snakes. Uh, 10 Deadliest Snakes in the World, excuse me. And he was now scheduled to film a spinoff called, called Ocean's Deadliest. In late August, Terry and the kids went to Tasmania to work on a Tasmanian devil conservation program there. Before he left for his dock, Steve told her, I'm getting to the point in my life where I'd like to spend more time being a dad, less time filming. I think after this documentary, I'm just going to slow down a bit. With all the filming. I'm, I'm, I'm saying those words weird though. But when Terry left, she felt a sense of foreboding. Uh, she felt like they should all be together, but they were separating. She described watching Steve wave goodbye as a, a poignant moment. Tragically, this would be the last time she would see her husband alive. Terry Irwin later wrote in her 2000, 2007 book, Steve always had a feeling that he wouldn't live a long life. He would sometimes say that he hoped a croc wouldn't get him because he felt it would undo all of his hard work, convincing people that crocs are wonderful animals worth protecting. 
After losing his mother, Steve seemed even more focused on accomplishing as much as possible in the time he had here on earth. He was convinced that when it was his time to go, it would be quick as his mom had died in that car accident. On September 4, 2006, at the age of only 44, Steve would die quickly. Steve and his crew were filming that ocean's deadliest dock near Port Douglas, Queensland. Steve was snorkeling near a stingray when he was stabbed suddenly in the heart by its venomous barb, and then he would die of cardiac arrest shortly after being stung. Steve death's a freak accident because stingrays not considered dangerous animals for the most part. Uh, Steve's best friend and cameraman, best friend at the time, Justin Lyons, witnessed the entire thing. He wouldn't reveal the full details publicly until a 2014 interview with Australian morning show Studio 10. Justin remembered how excited Steve was to face some of the ocean's deadliest creatures. He had plans to interact with sharks and sea snakes. He said, it's all the things that would normally make people cringe. This is what Steve loved. So he was very excited about it. They were eight days into filming on September 4th uh, when their filming was interrupted by rain. Their goal that day was to find a tiger shark, but the rain was stopping them. Justin told Studio 10, Steve was like a caged tiger when he couldn't do something, particularly on a boat. So he said, let's just go and do something. So we jumped into the inflatable boat. Off we went to look for something to do. Soon, Steve and Justin spotted an eight-foot stingray a short distance uh, from the boat. Justin thought it would be uh, some perfect B-roll for another project they had planned. They discussed a filming plan, got ready to shoot. The water was chest deep. Neither man was nervous. They'd been around stingrays, you know, m- multiple times before. Justin said, stingrays are normally very calm. If they don't want you around them, they'll just swim away. They're very fast swimmers. Filming was going smoothly. They got a lot of footage of the stingray. Uh, and then Steve and Justin decided to film just one last shot. The stingray was between the two men. Steve uh, was to swim towards the camera. Then Justin would film the stingray swimming away from him. But when Steve swam over the stingray, his shadow spooked it. Justin remembered all of a sudden, it popped on its front and started stabbing wildly with its tail. Hundreds of strikes in a few seconds. It probably thought Steve's shadow was a tiger shark who feeds on them pretty regularly. So it started to attack him. We had this rule that if Steve was ever hurt or injured, that we had to keep filming no matter what. Justin continued filming the stingray as it swam away. Initially, he didn't realize Steve had been really hurt. He panned the camera towards the stingray. Then when he turned back around towards Steve, he saw something horrifying. He said, Steve was standing in a huge pool of blood that I realized, uh, Steve was standing in a huge pool of blood. I realized something had gone wrong. Steve stood up out of the water and screamed, it's punctured my lung. Justin had to act fast. Their first priority was getting out of the water. Steve's blood was going to attract sharks if they stayed too long. Steve felt like he couldn't breathe. He said the bar punctured his lung. All Justin could see was a two-inch injury directly over his heart, blood pouring out of the wound. Justin said he had an extraordinary threshold for pain. So I knew that when he was in pain, that it must have been very painful. Even if we'd been able to get him to an emergency ward at that moment, we probably would not have been able to save him because the damage to his heart was massive. Justin got Steve back in the inflatable boat. He, He told him to think of his children. And then he said, he just sort of calmly looked up at me and said, I'm dying. And that was the last thing he said. They got back to Croc One, their main boat, in just 30 seconds. A crew member immediately put pressure on Steve's wound. Justin began CPR. The crew performed CPR for over an hour. This is so sad. Helicopter and medics were waiting for them at lower aisles. When they finally got to the medics, they pronounced Steve dead within 10 seconds of looking at him. Because of Steve's rule, there was a cameraman on board who filmed this entire ordeal. His will to live was so strong. He was so tough. He seemed so superhuman. They didn't think that uh, he was going to die even at the, by the time they got him back to the the medics until those medics said he was dead. The crew genuinely assumed Steve was going to wake up at some point and just be okay. So, which is why they kept filming. Justin Lyons said in 2014, he doesn't know where that video footage is, but hopes it's been destroyed. So it can never be released after his death. People accused Steve of acting irresponsibly around the stingray in 2014. Justin uh, dispelled that myth. Uh, you know, saying that for one thing, Steve did not pull the barb out himself. Like people thought he told studio 10, it's a jagged, sharp barb. It went through his chest, like a hot knife through butter. Jamie Seymour, a toxicologist aboard Croc one that day also told studio 10. It was just a really bad accident. If he'd been five feet, one side or coming from another direction, or the sun had been somewhere else. It wouldn't have happened. By and large, these things are referred to as the pussy cats of the ocean. They're not an issue, but just under some circumstances, it goes wrong worldwide. There are only one or sometimes two stingray deaths a year on average. Only two have been reported in the waters of Australia since 1945, and that's including Steve. Both deaths involved barbs to the chest. Uh, Steve left behind his wife, Terry, his two kids. Bindi's eight. Robert is just two. Uh, You know, Terry didn't have good phone service and Tasmania didn't hear right away what had happened. When she and the kids uh, arrive at Cradle Mountain National Park, she checks in, gets a notice that she has to call Steve's talent manager. The manager tells her over the phone there was an accident. They tried to revive him and they couldn't. Steve died. 
She sits in the office for a few minutes in shock, then goes out to the car to tell the kids what had happened. Terry remembers feeling comforted uh, that Steve had at least passed quickly. He'd always told her, I'm not afraid of death. I'm afraid of dying. Steve said, uh, or she said that she was glad he didn't suffer long. Uh, Years later, 2018, in an interview with People Magazine, Bindi will say, I remember people coming up to me and saying, I'm sorry for your loss, sweetheart. Time heals all wounds, but that's just not true. It's like losing a part of your heart. And when you've lost that, you never get it back. His buddy, Justin Lyon, said he was so good with animals, nothing was going to get him. We thought he was going to live forever, but it would always be a crazy, silly accident. And as it turns out, that's exactly what it was. All the staff at the zoo, of course, mourned his passing. People around the world mourned his passing. People came from all over the world to leave flowers at the Australia Zoo. Uh, Luckily, with a good team already in place to help run the zoo, uh, it would continue. They would continue their work, you know, operate just fine. Uh, They'd train them well. Shortly after his death, Steve was awarded honorary professorship by the University of Queensland School of Integrative Biology. Then on July 22nd, 2007, the Steve Irwin Wildlife Reserve is established a 334,000 acre area in Cape York. Terry published in her biography, Steve and Me, that same year, she wrote about the reserve. On July 22nd, 2007, the Steve Irwin Wildlife Reserve became official. The piece of land means so much to the Irwin family, and I know what it would have meant to Steve. Ultimately, it means the protection of his crocodiles, the animals he loved so much. What does the future hold for the Irwin family? Each and every day is filled with incredible triumphs and moments of terrible grief. And in between, life goes on. We are determined to continue to honor and appreciate Steve's wonderful spirit. It lives on with all of us. Steve lived every day of his life doing what he loved, and he always said he would die defending wildlife. I reckon Bindi, Robert, and I will do the same. Uh, Terry, Bindi, and Robert do continue to do Steve's work. Uh, Bindi's only 23, Robert just 18. Bindi and her husband, Powell, had their first child together. Steve's first grandkid, a daughter, Grace, March 25th, 2021. Uh, Back in 2013, Terry and Bindi ended a six-year campaign to prevent bauxite strip mining on the Steve Irwin Wildlife Reserve. In 2019, she, Bindi, and Robert began campaigning to overturn legislation that allows harvesting of wild crocodile eggs. Uh, Robert's now been on The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon over 10 times, uh, you know, giving a great exposure to his conservation efforts. The cumulative total of the videos he's uh, been on been viewed over 100 million times. They continue maintaining the zoo, rehabilitating animals, buying up land all over to establish wildlife conservations around the world. And that takes us out of this timeline. Good job, soldier. You've made it back. Barely. Steve Irwin, the croc hunter. Not a terribly long life, but such a memorable life. Uh, He accomplished so much. Uh, Would have been nice if he had accomplished, uh, you know, just a little bit more though, like by transitioning from the croc hunter to the creep hunter, like I alluded to at the beginning of the show, right? What if he was helping catch these dirt bags that we talk about here on Time Stick all the time? God, that'd be a, that'd be the best show ever. We got called out here, this dark wooded area, in this park at night, because we heard that a male bush beater is out here. We got peeping Tom, who locals are worried about becoming a little bit more aggro. This bloke's been wanking in these bushes for years. Recently, he started walking out and flashing ladies, so it's time to take him down. And release him inside a dangerous prison after telling numerous other inmates that he tried to bugger their mumps. Crikey, there he is. What a beauty. I'm going to distract him with some porn. Old copy of Hustler, I'll lay that as a trap. Climb this tree above it. And then when he picks it up, ripper. Yes, and I'll jump down on the tree on top and wrestle him to the ground. When he goes down, you pop the bag over his head, I'll hog time. In the van he goes. His waking in the woods days have come to an end. I'm Steve Owen, the creep hunter. Going dingo on another sicko. Bringing some thunder from down under. Putting some predator shrimp on the prison barbie. Ripper! Oi! Can't! Other Australian things that people say a lot. I know it needs work. <laughs> I know the taglines for the creep hunter need work. Probably a little less didgeridoo. But maybe something there. All right. Uh, so what did we learn today? Besides my Australian accent, probably still needs a lot of work. Uh, Stephen Robert Irwin, born in 1962 in the suburbs of Melbourne. His parents instilled a love of wildlife in him from a young age. He grew up in a house full of reptiles and orphan kangaroos that his parents cared for. Instead of playing with other kids at school, Steve spent a lot of his time catching snakes, lizards, exploring the nature around him. As an adult, he'd become an animal enthusiast, obsessed, a conservation worker, worldwide celebrity. Steve never had any college degrees, but he did receive quite the education growing up. He grew up studying and caring for animals at his parents' wildlife park. 
They seemed to have taught him everything that they knew, which was a lot. In 1970, his parents made a decision that would change his life forever. They purchased a small property out in Biwa, right? AKA hell on earth populated by nothing but scumbags. According to that one angry guy living there. And they turned their initial two acres into a zoo to fund their reptile collecting habits. Steve Irwin grew up in this wildlife park. He, he and his father went on field trips every week to catch and study reptiles. When he was at the park, he helped his mom rehabilitate injured and orphaned baby kangaroos. His parents taught him to love and care for all types of wildlife, from the cute and the cuddly to the venomous and the dangerous. Steve's favorite animals were crocs. He admired these majestic, wild apex predators. Steve caught his first croc at just nine years old using his father's innovative croc management techniques. In the 1980s, Steve and his dad worked for the Queensland East Coast Crocodile Management Program, catching nuisance crocodiles, relocating them. Soon, Steve would become known all over Australia for his innovative croc catching abilities. He loved his time out in the wilderness, sometimes isolated from civilization for months on end. In 1991, Steve's life changed again. His parents let him, uh, you know, manage the reptile park all by himself. Steve was now responsible for hundreds of animals. Days later, he meets his wife, Terry, a future conservationist from Eugene, Oregon. They get married in 1992, spent their honeymoon filming a croc catching adventure. Uh, this uh, documentary would become the first episode of the hit TV show, The Crocodile Hunter. The show would run for 10 years on Animal or Discovery's Animal Planet and was wildly successful. Steve's enthusiastic personality combined with his close encounters with animals and educational content was loved by millions across the world. The Steve Irwin brand soon was known everywhere. Steve used his fame to promote wildlife conservation for the animals of the world, especially the dangerous, scary animals. Steve and Terry used the money from their show to expand their zoo and purchase hundreds of acres, thousands and thousands of acres for wildlife conservation. At the peak of his success, Steve then died in a freak accident involving a stingray. While filming an ocean documentary with his crew, a startled stingray stabbed uh, him repeatedly in the heart with a venomous barb. Steve died from cardiac arrest within minutes, leaving behind a wife, two young kids, and a legacy of the crocodile hunter in the Australia Zoo. Steve Irwin is remembered for his contributions to wildlife education, conservation, as well as his donations to animal charities, as well as crikey, ripper. I mean, come on. Every November uh, 15th, now Steve Irwin Day, an international day of recognition of his life and work. Terry, Bindi, Robert continue his work to this day, expanding the Australia Zoo, buying land to protect wildlife across the planet. And Steve in death continues to inspire. I'm inspired. Right? Put everything you've got into what you're passionate about. Try and make every day your best day. Why not? What the fuck, what the fuck else should we... I gotta stop this too bad. What else should we be doing? But seriously, very inspiring. And now let's hit those top five takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. The number one, Steve Irwin was born in the suburbs of Melbourne. But when he was eight, he and his family moved to uh, hell on earth, uh, Biwa, uh, after his parents purchased a plot of land to start a wildlife park. Steve grew up this, uh, on this park, caring for reptiles and mammals. Steve idolized his father, Bob, who taught him everything he knew about how to handle and manage dangerous species of wildlife. Number two, Steve and his father, Bob, worked for the East Coast Crocodile Management Program. They pioneered revolutionary croc catching techniques still used today. Bob and Steve were anti-sedation. They captured crocs by jumping on them, wrestling them, or setting up elaborate traps. They were known across Australia for their skills, spent years responding to calls in far north Queensland to catch nuisance saltwater crocodiles. Number three, Steve Irwin took over the wildlife park in 1991. He and his wife, Terry, renamed it the Australia Zoo in 1992. They spent years building up the park and making it home to hundreds of animals from kangaroos to freshwater crocodiles. Number four, Steve and Terry Irwin filmed their summer 1992 honeymoon catching crocs and studying wildlife in far north Queensland. And that footage would become the first episode of The Crocodile Hunter, Steve's famous TV show. The show ran for over a decade in Australia, then on American TV channel Animal Planet. Steve touched the hearts of millions of people and uh, all across the world. He used the show to emphasize his mission statement, education through exciting entertainment. And number five, new info. Was The Croc Hunter afraid of anything other than getting married? And the answer is yes. Steve was, this is so random, terrified of parrots. First revealed in a 2001 interview with Scientific American. He told his interviewer, for some reason, parrots have to bite me. It's their job. I don't know why that is. They've nearly torn my nose off. I've had some really bad parrot bites. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Parrots make me nervous too, right? That beak is too big. But I would rather have a parrot near me than a crocodile. Uh, Crikey, the croc hunter Steve Irwin has been sucked. 
Uh, that was a fun uh, change of pace episode. I hope you liked it. Uh, thanks to the Bad Magic team for help in production. I've uh, been rallying strong recently. Queen of Bad Magic, Lindsay Cummins. Thanks to Logan Keith for uh, fucking doing everything. Uh, but for directing, producing today. Thanks to Bitelixir for upkeep on the Time Suck app for uh, teaching me uh, some things with trivia and stuff, how to do it. The Art Warlock, Logan Keith, creating the merch at badmagicmerch.com, helping run our socials. Uh, thanks to Sophie Evans for the initial research this week. Also, thanks to the All Seeing Eyes moderating the Cult of the Curious private Facebook page, the Mod Squad for making sure Discord keeps running smooth, and everyone over on the Time Suck Reddit thread. Uh, that subreddit, r slash Time Suck. Next week on Time Suck, we're going to dive into a lesser known cult called Conscious Development of Body, Mind, and Soul. Cult, cult, cult. And its enigmatic leader, a woman named Terry Hoffman. Beginning in the 1960s in the Dallas suburbs, Terry, a woman who had grown up impoverished and in an orphanage, taught a variety of mumbo jumbo from all sorts of esoteric forms of knowledge. Most of it was taken directly from other writers, including the concept of karma, past lives, hidden temples in the astral world, possibly the most strange, the black lords who are responsible for the world's catastrophes and must be fought physically by doing strange karate type moves. So that's pretty fucking sweet. Her followers believed in all this shit. One woman, Glenda Goodman, recounting her experience would gush that Terry and Marcus took Jupiter and Venus by the hand and led us to a beautiful glittering house in the purple realm. It was our house. <laughs> they wanted to show us our home in the purple realm where we go to rest and renew ourselves after time in the physical. Man, if that was a sales pitch for some hallucinogens. I'm fucking sold. Uh, and Glenda, along with her husband, David, would soon find themselves in the darkest of mindsets, a dark mindset that would ultimately claim the lives of 11 people in the cult. Though the vast majority of them were declared suicides and Terry Hoffman was never charged for the brainwashing many things she was responsible for. Many also think it's not sheer coincidence that in all these deaths, especially two of Terry's husbands, Terry stood the most to benefit financially as people would take out life insurance policies shortly before randomly dying and uh, then willing their estates to her. So why was Terry Hoffman never charged with anything? How did she brainwash her followers? What happened to the many people who mysteriously died around her? All that and more next week on Time Suck. And now let's head on over to this week's Time Sucker updates. Updates. Get your Time Sucker updates. Let's start with some comedy. Uh, longtime sucker, funny sack, Kim Malone <laughs> has a Papa John's update. She writes, better ingredients, better sex, Papa John's. And she included a link to an article on lawandcrime.com from July 16th with the following headline. Ex-Papa John's employee who killed co-workers and attempted to have sexual intercourse with one of the deceased sentenced to 65 years. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Says a 20-year-old former Papa John's restaurant employee in Indiana received the maximum prison sentence for shooting two of his former co-workers to death and attempting to have sexual intercourse with one of the victims after she was dead. Circuit Court Judge Michael Christofan Christofino ordered Jose Benitez Tilly to serve 65 years in prison for shooting and killing Haley Smith, 22, and Dustin Carr, 37, as they were working the night shift at the restaurant earlier this year. Under a plea agreement, Benitez Tilly agrees to serve six, to serve two 65-year sentences to run concurrently, and prosecutors agreed to drop one count of abuse of a corpse. So I had no idea. Uh, some true crime uh, worthy of an episode here on Time Suck has actually occurred at a Papa John's. While I've been making the Papa John's joke. Well, the, the headlines come out while I've been making the Papa John's jokes. So thank you, Kim. Uh, one more Papa John's update. The Suck has a home in at least one of their franchises. Better podcast, better pizza. Papa Lee of Vandenberg writes, Hi, I just got done listening to the Times Like episode about Alive, the plane crash in the Andes. Just wanted to let you know I was dying laughing the whole time. I work at Papa John's. <laughs> So all your comments are extra funny to me. So I'd also like to know that we walk around the store now saying better ingredients, fresher friends and better human, f <laughs> better human flesh, better pizza. Thanks for making us laugh. I love all the shows. You're a killer or maybe your dad is. Uh, thank you, Leah. I hope the running gag is still at least getting some smiles at your job. That fucking cracks me up. I hope my jokes haven't ruined the taste of Papa John's for you. and made you think about how, you know, human flesh when you should be just enjoying the tasty pepperonis. They're probably not made out of human flesh. I don't know. I don't work there. You do. Maybe they are. Uh, now for a mysterious disappearances update from a mysterious meat sack. This is disturbing. Uh, from Philip, who is going to share a fucking wild nightmare with us. Philip writes, Hey there, master suckety suck sucker. King of fuck. Bojangles bitch. Nimrod's prophet. Lucifina's boy toy. Any other title I've forgotten to uh, make up. Uh, I was listening to 303 Mysterious Disappearances at work tonight. You brought up disassociative amnesia. I've experienced something very similar to this, although not quite the same. I thought you may like reading a first-person experience. If not, that's cool too. 
I suffered a lot of injuries as well as a traumatic brain injury for 10 plus years that put me in a coma. I still have small flashes of memories from when I first woke up and it was terrifying. I had no idea who I was. I had zero memories. I was in a white room full of machines. Many of them hooked to me in some way. I couldn't understand anything. I was aware of what objects were called, but had no idea how I knew that. I had absolutely no past experiences to connect to anything around me. I didn't know why I was afraid, but I was horrified and helpless and my only instinct was survival. My memory blacks out there, but I'm told that I tried to escape, ended up tip, tripping over my own cables and catheter tubing. Apparently that was painful enough to stop me and the nurses, nurses wrestled me back into bed and then calmed me. Fast forward a bit and I remember being wheeled to a rehabilitation center connected to the hospital. I spent about a month there. I was told about my accident, but I didn't remember it. In fact, I still remembered nothing before my coma, quote, wake up. I was aware of my name now, my birth date. It was just me. My parents were with me. I was aware they were my parents, my brother too. I called them all by their names. I loved them, but uh, felt that I could, and felt that I could trust them, but I didn't know how or why I felt these things. You may have noticed by now that I haven't described myself as knowing anything, even myself at this point. That's because I didn't, I didn't know anything. This was a massive internal struggle that nearly fucked me up and drove me insane. So many questions ran through my mind. Am I even real? Am I brainwashed? Am I still in a coma? Is my mind trapped inside of a comatose body? And this is what the result is. Maybe I'm dead. A program. Nothing felt real. I was so fucked up on intravenous morphine that I couldn't even feel any of the pain that everyone was telling me I was going through either. Broken bones, brain injury, uh, nerve damage, degloved face. I did an image search to find out what that meant, by the way. And dear God, I'll never get those images out of my head. Uh, I felt nothing, nothing physical. Anyway, my brain was a battlefield. I was constantly fighting down fear, anxiety, the thought of breaking out and running until I couldn't anymore. Maybe my parents weren't my parents. Maybe I was just programmed somehow to think these things and feel safe so that everyone could use me. Luckily, near the end of my month in rehabilitation, my memories began to drip back in slowly, randomly, but consistently. This likely saved me from going insane. This process of memory recovery kind of sped up over time. Sometimes I'd have massive memory dumps into my brain that left me feeling dizzy, nauseated, surreal. Today, my memories are mostly restored. I still have a lot of missing moments from the two-ish years before the accident, but these sometimes flood in suddenly even now. I honestly still remember, or I honestly still wonder at times if I'm still in a coma and still living out my life inside of my head. I don't even know if that's possible, but it's kind of scary to think about. So I try to squash those thoughts quickly when they surface. This was quite lengthy, so I'm sorry for that, but I hope it was interesting. Oh, it was. I truly appreciate you, your wife, Logan, the community, absolutely everyone that makes bad magic possible. All of you have impacted my life in a massively positive way. Much love. Holy shit, Philip. Your story is nothing short of terrifying. It made me think of being on too much acid recently, but then, but then add to that, like uh, being badly injured. Like what if the skin on my face was detached from the skull and so much more and, and about like what it would feel like to be at the peak of a really intense, like, like acid high, but then for a whole month instead of a few hours. Whew. Uh, sorry you went through that. Sounds unbelievably awful. Thank God you're doing so well now. Uh, yeah, sounds like you disappeared from yourself for a while. Amnesia is fucking scary. So, uh, so crazy. So, uh, so thank you for sharing that, man. So glad that you, uh, were able to come back from all that. And now for one quick update on Peter Nygaard, uh, coming from Canadian super sucker, Mark, who writes, Hey, Hey, Lord Nimrod, Mark from Winnipeg again, just spoke to my dad who's 72 years old about super creep Peter Nygaard. He said, everyone kind of knew Nygaard was a creep, but he also told me something interesting. He said he once spoke with the Canadian attorney general about Nygaard. And apparently way back in 1970, they had lots of info on his creepiness, but just didn't think they could make any charges stick. How things could have been different if they had. Thanks again for the great episode. Mark from Winnipeg. Well, thanks for writing in again, Mark. Uh, Had a couple Winnipeg suckers write in about this. And that is, yeah, that is so unfortunate that they they already had a lot of information back in 1970. And, And we went over, like we knew they had some, but it sounds like he had probably been doing a lot of stuff for years by 1970. You know, but he wouldn't get thrown in jail and not allowed to, you know, leave on bail for literally 50 years. Like, I wonder how far back the info went, like 1969, 1965. When did did he commit his first sex crime? Mid 20s, early 20s, teens. And now he's 81 and only been behind bars for a year and a half. Almost made it. Almost pulled off a very long life of being a super predator and never paying the price for it. Of also living in luxury for almost his entire life. Too bad Steve Irwin, the creep hunter, right? Again, wasn't real and couldn't have nabbed him, right? That'd been great. Just crikey, ripper. Look at the plumage on the head of the strange Canadian pedo bird. I'm going to grab it and wrestle him to the ground where he put the bag over his head and throw him into the van. 
Rampa. Thanks, everyone. That's all the messages for this week. Next time, suckers. I needed that. We all did. Another Bad Magic Productions podcast is done. Please do not try to wrestle any Crocs into submission this week. You're not Steve Irwin. It's not your job. You're probably not very good at it. Just focus on continuing to keep on sucking. Bad Magic Productions. Crikey! Look at that! Look at that in that Russian tracksuit! It's a. Oh no, it's a Chikatilo! Oh, this is a formidable predator! He's tricky! I wrestle, I wrestle these creeps! But this one wrestles back! You really gotta keep an eye out for his limp shamecock! He'll jerk it under his sweats, but it's very disturbing! It won't hurt you physically, but it wears you down mentally! What is big deal? So we like to wrestle. I wrestle the creep hunter. I jerk off shame clock bother no one. Are you bothering me, mate? You fucking cunt. I'm gonna wrestle you down, put you in a cage, put you out of your misery, my friend. <laughs> what the fuck am I doing? <laughs>